St. Vincent Hospital. Yeah, All right. sure. yeah. and, and who is um, and, and who is with you also? So I Are have Dr. Charles Garvin uh, Charles. with the uh, health system, Sue Cray with the Sisters of Charity Foundation and the Health Campus, and Dr. Mike Viscaro. All right, move up. And Metro Hospital is here for uh, what? Observation. Observation. Yeah, it's important that we know and we see what's going on and reach in. That's real good. Who's from Sisters of Charity? Well, I'm the I'm the health system president for the Sisters of Charity. You know, I gotta say this with the Sisters of Charity. I uh, one of the pioneers of the uh, of the fatherhood movement yes. and the Sisters of Charities in the nineties used to fund Fathers and Families Together program. Yes, we did. You guys did. Yes. And then I was blessed to take it to a national level. But with you guys funding, you made it possible. And now fatherhood is, uh, is everywhere. So I, I want to personally thank you. Um, we even had a young African-American males program that you fund. It was called YAMS. And uh, walking the streets and uh, talking with young African-American males and making sure that they were uh, good citizens and good fathers, and, and they would be in a hospital also. Yeah. It was um, awesome. boot camp, boot camps for dads. Yep. Oh, nice. That Sorry. was the nineties. Oh. Before your, I was born then. <laughs> he is a great father, <laughs> Vice Chair Charles, Charles Life. He brings his son <laughs> awesome. down to council meetings. He, uh, you know, children need to see success every day. He he uh, takes his son to the to the museum. He talks with his son, he coaches and counsels his son, he is there, and he probably teaches the best thing that a father can do for his children Aww. is to respect his children's mother. So all of those things, the son get a chance to see a great, great role model, and he practiced what he preached in fatherhood. And it's an honor to know you, young man. Thank you. Yeah, so we go back to that. So, uh, Chris, you'll introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Chris Harsh, Council Ward 13. Hi, Chris. Nice, Chris. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. He's, he's, he's good. He was an activist also, and uh, I already told you great things about Charles' life. You went and so, right along. Let's yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I'll, I'll sit back and listen to you, Jan. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for having us here. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, just a little background on me. So I actually background was with... Us. Uh, I retired from Cleveland Clinic after 40 years. I'm a registered nurse. My clinical background is critical care. I retired and came to the Sisters of Charity as their ministry leader. Then I became president of St. Vincent's during COVID. I was the president. And then after COVID, I became the president of the health system. So um, we're honored to be here. Again, my team will uh, you know, be filling in as well. Um, just to kind of level the playing field, you know, the Sisters of Charity have been uh, here on our 171 years. Uh, they came from France, uh, and they came, yes, yeah, they came from France. They were um, really brought here by Bishop Armadeus Rapp of the Diocese of Cleveland to really take care of the poor and meet their health needs. And they were really the first public health nurses uh, in Cleveland. And they literally, when they came here, they had no home. So they went out into the neighborhood and took care of people in their homes. Um, they opened St. Vincent Charity Medical Center in 1865 and uh, have been in Central ever since. That was a great year, 1865 was a great year. They did it in 1864? 1865. was a great year, Emancipation yeah. Proclamation. That's right. That's right. And, and to just underscore, this is the sisters' second pandemic. They were here in 1918, so they were here for the Spanish-American flu. Uh, their ministries, they have several ministries in Cleveland, Joseph and Mary's home, and it is really, uh, it's respite care for the homeless, uh, and it's for men and women, and, and so uh, really important work that the sisters have done. Uh, the Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland uh, have really been, uh, you know, absolute heroes in working against homelessness and poverty, and Sue will tell you more about that. And then building healthy communities. 
Uh, the sisters' constant mission is really to meet uh, the unmet needs of the people we serve, and not only their health needs, but we, you know, emotional, just the trauma that our, our, the people that live in our neighborhood suffer from, and their economic needs as well. Uh, and again, this is our constant mission, and despite all the changes that we've seen in healthcare, and I'll talk to you more about COVID because I was at the hospital during all of COVID. Uh, we had to make some very hard decisions because of the financial instability that we were starting to feel uh, because of the losses. On September 14th, we shared with the community that it was necessary for us to change um, and it make a significant shift uh, and that we were seeing after COVID. So, and I'm, I'll just underscore, you'll remember when COVID hit, um, March 17th, uh, Governor DeWine really called, told all hospitals, you have to stop doing elective surgery right now. Uh, there was a concern that the surge was going to hit and that there would be a lack of personal protective equipment and gear for all the hospitals and it will really create a, you know, a terrible uh, tragedy with, with the pandemic the way that it was going. So that morning, um, I had to go up to the operating rooms at St. Vincent's. Uh, the operating rooms were all set up. The nurses and doctors were all there ready to start, about 100 staff, and we had to stop immediately doing surgery. We could only do urgent um, and emergent. We could not do any kind of elective cases. Um, that, just to show you the impact of that, that first month of not doing any of our normal surgery cases, uh, the sister, we lost $3 million in one month. And I will tell you that the sisters have been subsidizing losses at St. Vincent's for decades, for decades, and into the millions of dollars. So You have a lobbyist downstate to uh, lobby to bring in state funding for it? We do, and again, you know, during COVID, you know, I think everyone, and we're, we're seeing the aftermath of COVID still as it relates to, you know, how is healthcare changing? So you'll remember, you know, really the hospitals went into lockdown, you know, people couldn't come in. And quite honestly, after, you know, the vaccines came out, people really didn't want to come back. And that was one of the things that we saw. So there were definitely industry-wide changes underway because of the pandemic. COVID-19 made it even more difficult financially and magnified really the things that we we're facing. Um, again, the, the, as I said, the profound effect on the finances just didn't go away. We had imagined that before the pandemic, when I had gotten there, we had a strategic plan that was really looking at to closing the gap of the, the continued losses. Uh, they wanted us to get to a sustainable, you know, way that we could continue our services, both on the surgical side. So you'll know St. Vincent's is a very big spine hospital. There's high-end spine and orthopedics as an institute. And the, uh, the head physician of that is Dr. Luke Kepler. And also we had a very strong bariatric program um, that's been there in high quality, great care. And then the other piece of really the mission work of the sisters is behavioral health. And it's a deep commitment to Rosary Hall, which was founded by Sister Ignatia Gavin. She was a sister at Charity St. Augustine. And she had, and the sisters really realized that alcoholism was a disease. And that they, the people that suffered with alcoholism needed help. And so they created Rosary Hall and the 12 step process with Dr. Bob and actually was actually founded at St. Thomas in Akron and they brought it to St. Vincent's in 1952. And honestly, they've saved thousands of lives uh, with the, their commitment to that. Mm -hmm. So the pandemic again, uh, you know, that created some very, you know, new things that we were starting to see. And one, we were hoping that when we came out of the surge, that our volumes, the volumes in terms of the inpatient census would come back up, and it never did. Our volumes dropped 30%. Wow. And so, and, and the sisters really do take care of the poorest of the poor. We never turned down anyone because of their ability to pay. Um, and so, you know, that, that really is important. I want to call out uh, certainly about, we have, you know, there's seven, uh, EDs, psychiatric EDs in the state. Two of them are in Ohio. Uh, we have the Psych ED at St. Vincent's, and then there's one in Cincinnati. And I really want to call out Scott Osicki and the Adams Board uh, for supporting us all these years for decades. And it really, we couldn't do it without them. So we're really grateful for that. But at any rate, we reached. Would you a like point. Scott to come to the table? Because we're going to ask him some questions um, shortly. Sure. Um, Scott?
Yeah, 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 Chairman. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh, you lost your pen. Do you need yes. another one? Do you need, does the there. chair need to make one? Perhaps. Yes. So when we look at, you know, what, what the, the change, you know, the transition was for St. Vincent's, it was that we realized that we could no longer, with those decreased volumes, continue to provide acute inpatient care. And when I talk about inpatient, that means patients that are admitted to the hospital and stay days. And then, obviously, when they get to a certain level and their, their condition is improved, they get discharged. That is very, very expensive care. And, and the other thing that over time did occur at St. Vincent's is that some of the big programming, like cardiac intervention, neuro for you know stroke care, uh, high-end oncology, it was very difficult for St. Vincent's to continue to compete in the healthcare corridor that we're in with Cleveland Clinic, UH, and Metro. It's not a criticism, it's just that we couldn't. And it was very difficult for the sisters. Those were things that they did not want to give up, but candidly, we could not, the volumes were way too low, and it made it not really the right thing to do for patients. So, on- I just uh, want to, I'm gonna have her finish, and she's gonna introduce other people, and I'll put you down and ask a question. Would you want to make okay. a point on this? When you say the sisters, mm -hmm. Who are you talking to? I keep hearing the sisters. The, the sisters, sisters, sisters of Charity of St. Augustine. Charity. They're the yeah. owners it, it, of St. Vincent. Give a background. The owners yes, the they're owners. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right, right, right. And it, no, no, that's right. That's well, the a group of nuns. Yeah. Hanging out at the yeah. No. Hospital. Well, there's a, there's a large group of nuns that actually you know have spent okay. their lives okay. at taking care of patients. Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> not no, be clear. Okay, if you don't know, then you need a point of clarity. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Right. So. That's good. Well. Good, uh, Councilman. On the uh, on on September 15th, you know, we actually when we made the announcement uh, about the future of St. Vincent's, uh, I want to just say that 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 was a very difficult decision, and on a number of fronts. Number one, we're just coming off of a pandemic, so our staff have been working like heroes for two years, and they made many sacrifices during that time. Um, I think the other thing is that we wanted to make sure that we took good care of our our, our staff because many of the the staff at St. Vincent's have worked at St. Vincent's their entire career. They've never been anywhere else. So we have tenured staff that have worked there 30, 40, even 50 years. Wow. So that, that was a, a you know substantial change. So I just want to underscore that, that they, they have been wonderful. Um, what services as of November 15th that will remain at St. Vincent's will be care that we can provide on the outpatient basis. So that means patients come in, they get their care, and then they go home. And honestly, if we look across the United States since COVID, the, you know, a look at outpatient care, it's growing. And we learned during COVID that patients could be seen on an outpatient basis. We saw a, a really an increase in telehealth kinds of visits where you people- see a trend. You there's see a trend. trend. Yes, happening. yes. And so uh, we will have behavioral health, so we'll have outpatient mental health, addiction treatment, including Rosary Hall, which I you know, indicated is for alcohol and drugs, and the psychiatric ED. And my colleagues are gonna tell you more about the, those programs. Uh, we will also have primary care, and we, we talk about primary care, you know, primary care physicians seeing patients as needed on an outpatient basis. So just like you go to your doctor every year and get all your tests and vaccines, you know, annual care, or if you have any issues, to come in and see your primary care doctor. And then and the ED, so we have an emergency room, but by CMS regs, when without inpatient beds, you really cannot call yourself an emergency department. So we will actually be and provide urgent care. And I just want to really underscore for you that the we've watched the trends at St. Vincent's over the last number of years. And because of our inability, again, not to provide the highest level cardiac because it's provided by the other health systems, oncology and neuro, we weren't getting those patients anyhow. They were going by us. And so that literally is, we will, we will continue to take care of the basic needs of people in our urgent care, and we have a plan for that. So that literally is, you know, how the decision was made. Um, I just really, again, want to, you know, underscore um, the sisters 
have no intention of leaving East 22nd. They never have, and they will not abandon the poor. And I, you, you probably all know this, you know, during the pandemic, um, you know, the hospital had to close down. Our neighbors, all of our neighbors, they eat at St. Vincent's. They buy their food out of our cafeteria. There's, there's not anywhere for them. And so we were really concerned during the pandemic about how were they gonna eat. And so our staff actually worked with CMHA and made hot meals and took them out to the poor to try and help. I mean, it was really, and that was really a long haul for the, the people that live there because some really couldn't get out. And even if they did get out, there's nowhere for them to get food. So um, that's the commitment of the sisters. And I will tell you, Sister Judith Ann is our congregational leader. I'm an associate of the order and we are committed to the poor and to East 22nd and the central neighborhood. And so you're gonna hear more about what, what, how our vision for the future, um, how we can you know, continue to meet the unmet needs of the people that live in that area, but also to really consider the social determinants of health, looking at food and housing, and Sue's gonna talk more about that. Mm -hmm. So again, um, I, I really, you know, am honored and humbled to be here to talk to you uh, again as the sisters continue to have, to, they've had to change all along. And you know in Cleveland, hospitals have evolved and gone and, you know, they served for hundreds of years and then, you know, change happens. And so we're committed though to being here. We love our neighborhood and we love taking care of the poor. So then I'm going to stop. Can you introduce I'm everyone gonna, yeah. else uh, so, also? Sure. So, Chuck, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, Chuck Garvin. I am a family physician, primary care doctor uh, in town for about 30. I grew up here, but I've been working for about 35 years in, in primary care. We're, uh, at one time or another, uh, part of all the health systems uh, in town, and, um, and, and more recently with the Sisters of Charity here at St. Vincent. I'm Susanna Cray, and I'm uh, currently the president of the Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland, and it is that organization that back in 2006 uh, decided to do a considerable amount of funding around the central neighborhood uh, to support the residents and the families of that community. And back in 2010, we were the organization that launched the concept with many community partners around the Cleveland Central Promise neighborhood. And Ms. Rashawn Bunton, who now manages, she's the managing director of the Cleveland Central Promise neighborhood. She's also in the audience today. And we've done a considerable amount of work through the Promise neighborhood in really trying to build relationships and trust, give agencies to the family, to really improve many aspects of the quality of life for the residents in, in uh, the central neighborhood. And most recently, I've been asked to lead the St. Vincent Charity Health Campus, which is really dedicated to bringing social determinants of health on that campus. And I think that's really a result of so much of the work that the foundation has done in that neighborhood to understand the residents, the families, and the communities, and what some of the challenges of disinvestment and structural racism that has existed in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Sir? How you doing? Um, I'm Dr. Mike Viscaro. I'm a clinical psychologist and a board certified forensic psychologist. I've been in the community for about 20 years, providing direct service, also in administration. I've worked at the VA hospital um, St. Vincent's, the health system. I've been in private practice, community mental health. Um, you know, I've worked in the criminal justice system, in the jails, also with the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services at North Coast and Summit Behavioral Health Care, so at the state hospital system. Um, so I've been around a lot and, and seen um, um, mental health and addiction very up close and personal um, as a provider, but also um, building, developing programs and. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So, nice to meet you. It's it great meeting you guys. Matter of fact, I'll be at your hospital today at um, two o'clock. Yes, for to... Rosary Hall. Mm. Is that uh, no? You know, oh. my, my, my doctor sent me. Oh, in okay. There. <laughs> <laughs> so today's the seventieth anniversary of Rosary Hall. So I thought you so, were coming so, today. So my uh, when is uh, what we're tied? Two o'clock is the mass of the chapel. <laughs> well, I stick my head in there. You yes, give me first. I will. Do yes. this, this, this doctor yes. piece. This first thing first. Yes. Um, 
I think I'm on the first floor. They have to draw some blood or something. All right. Like that. Yes. Okay. And then I. Uh, well, we'll look for you. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm walking in around two o'clock. All right. I'll find so you. I'll be, I'll be there. All right. Okay. Scott. Yes. yes. Um, good morning. I'm Scott Osicki. I'm the chief executive officer of the Adams Board of Cuyahoga County. That's the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board. Um, I've been with the board for over 28 years. I've been CEO for four and a half years. Um, and this is... Scott, let me ask you a question before you yield to the chairman. <laughs> Sorry. Because <laughs> yes. you know, I used to, like I work with you, with, with uh, your group, as you know, I work with the Adams Board. I would yeah. go down state, and mm -hmm. I lobby with these guys a lot, mm -hmm. uh, especially with Bill Danahan and Scott. Uh -huh. uh, funding. We, do you think there's a way we could talk with uh, some state reps, state senators, the governor, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. to lobby for funding? For St. Vincent or yes, for, for Saint yeah, Vincent. yeah, we could not we could, for you guys for St. Vincent for, for Saint Vincent. Right. I mean, we could certainly do that, but the Adams Board we have uh, continued to fund yes. St. Vincent's emergency psychiatric emergency department. We've been the sole funder of that for a very long time, and our funding was never in jeopardy to St. Vincent's. Um, we've been working with them. Um, there was a lot of unfortunately conflicting messages going out in the community as to what was going to happen with the psychiatric emergency department, but the funding was never in jeopardy or the support from the Adams board was never in jeopardy. We've been funding the psych ED, uh, psych ED for over 20 years. Uh, we've actually increased funding to the psychiatric emergency department this year to a total of $4,447,412. So um, the psychiatric emergency department has always been well funded and supported uh, by the Adams Board. It's a very important part uh, of the community having those those services available. You know, they provide, you know, crisis stabilization for people uh, with a, a psychiatric emergency. They provide 23-hour observation. And another important thing they do is they provide linkages to services for the people who, who um, would visit the psychiatric emergency department. We'll get back to you in a second. Um, what about the operating budget is coming up from downstate and the governor, they have some more pandemic dollars. Mm -hmm. Do you think we might be able to um, petition for us some money dealing with the operating budget? budget? We talk with their state reps, state senators mm -hmm. to uh, get them to help us out with that, you think? Mm -hmm. they, well, you know, the Adams Board has also made requests downstate for our ARPA funding, and uh, we haven't heard back yet on that. So, I mean, that would certainly be something, I mean, we could joint St. Vincent's and asking, um, you know, for additional funding. But, you know, we're, our responsibility is for the psychiatric emergency department or, or, and Rosary Hall as well. And we also fund, we will we'll be funding Rosary Hall for those outpatient services as well. Awesome. Yeah, because, you know, the state operating um, budget is um, next year. Yes. And you have to put in for it. I think that um, Sisters of Charity and... Um, uh, if they brought in the state, their state reps and state senators mm -hmm. to talk with them and mm -hmm. burn a letter down to uh, whoever the governor might might be, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we try to get ahead of it right now. Yes. And we lobby for the dollars. Right. Yes, we do. And, and we know that the governor supports mental health and addiction services. Yeah. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're there. Yeah. To the chair. Yep. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bob Fowler. I am the chair of the Adams Board here with Mr. Oseki this morning. Okay. So, and, and Mr. Chair, yes. if I could also add, we have, we have Maggie Tolbert uh, with us. Uh, she is a psychiatric nurse. She is uh, our assistant chief clinical officer. And actually, Maggie oversees all the crisis services, and especially with psychiatric emergency room at, um, at St. Vincent. I'll do a sidebar with you anyway. Um, could you guys have any charity events just coming up? Um, uh, I know Beth, uh, Beth, well, Beth, know, Beth we Zietlos was also it, here. We're out there in the audience. We'll come. We'll, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to after. You. Yeah, whenever and then we can talk with Beth. you call me for anything, I'm there. Yeah, okay. Oh, definitely. We know that. Right. <laughs> we appreciate your support. We're there. Yeah. Yes, so we're, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Garvin, and he'll talk about the services that will remain and amplify on that at St. Vincent's. Uh, so thanks for letting me Doctor, talk. Doctor. Thank you. And uh, thanks for letting me talk well, about it. Your councilman is here. I, yes. we, met, uh, we met uh, a couple, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago at, the, uh, at, at the, his town hall. Mm -hmm. uh, so thanks for letting me talk about the future of, of health care services uh, on the, on the uh, St. Vincent campus. 
what I'll do is I'll tell you what's going to be there when the, when inpatient services stop. I'll tell you what's going to be there on November 16th. I'll tell you our our plans to sort of grow that over time, and I'll tell you uh, the impact that I believe that that's going to have on on the neighborhood. Uh, we are going to continue, as uh, as uh, Jan Murphy already said, we're going to continue outpatient behavioral health services. We're going to uh, continue primary care. Uh, outpatient services, and we're going to have a seven-day week uh, urgent care. For behavioral health, we are going to continue the psychiatric emergency department. Uh, uh, with thanks to the Adams Board, uh, we, we could not do that without them, and they have, have been, as you heard, a long-term funder and have already committed to continuing to fund our psych psychiatric emergency department. I'm going to ask you to not be alarmed if by chance you hear in the next a couple of weeks that there is a name change. We might not be called emergency department. We might not be called psychiatric emergency department. But I can tell you that the services that we provide are going to be the same. So we're going to do the same services. Uh, we'll be ready for uh, 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 for all the police uh, folks and, that bring us. And EMS as well. Police, EMS, EMS. Yes. And we're going to, we, we will uh, we will operate the same way. There might be some, Jan already mentioned that CMS has some regulations about whether you can be called an emergency department if you're not a department of a inpatient hospital. Even if that happens, we have plans worked out to provide the same services. So psychiatric emergency department is going to continue. Good, good, good. Uh, Rosary Hall will continue to do addiction services. Uh, we have an outpatient uh, behavioral health clinic at this time, staffed by both psychiatrists and with uh, counselors. And you'll hear uh, shortly from Dr. Mike Piscaro about uh, new programming for behavioral health services expanding into a, a new area of unmet need, and that is uh, uh, crisis stabilization and recovery. So you'll hear more about that in a couple of minutes. But that's uh, behavioral health. For primary medical care, we have five in, or four internal medicine docs who are going to be remaining uh, with us uh, on the campus. In addition to those four internal medicine doctors, there is an internal medicine training program that is, their, all their inpatient work has moved elsewhere, but they are going to continue to operate uh, uh, outpatient primary care internal medicine clinics for scheduled patients and for walk-in. That group is supervised all the time by uh, attending board-certified internal medicine docs, uh, but that, that group sees patients Monday through Friday from 1 to 5. Uh, are in, the, in the, these primary care doctors, Jan already talked about this a little bit, these are the doctors who provide uh, preventive services like annual exams and immunizations and health screenings to look for illness early or uh, ca uh, cancer screening. They take care of acute uh, illnesses every day, stuff that's not bad enough to be in the hospital but you're pretty sick. Uh, and they also do a lot of work with ongoing long-term chronic care conditions. So primary care docs uh, look after folks with heart disease and hypertension and diabetes and depression and anxiety, arthritis, the stuff that isn't cured but is managed over a period of time. The primary, con uh, primary care docs uh, do that and will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Urgent care, we expect to have urgent care seven days a week. Uh, there is a, uh, an independent uh, group at this time that is planning to come right to, where, right to our current emergency department. This will, uh, in, in terms of who can go there with their, uh, uh, with their injuries and, or their, uh, their acute illnesses, it will be about the same as who goes there already. So even though, we're, even though it is an emergency department, Jan already mentioned this, because we don't have services for trauma, for strokes, for heart attacks, uh, for cancer, uh, EMS passes us up to go to other hospitals that are equipped to handle those things already. Mm -hmm. So uh, essentially the things that are taken care of in our emergency department today will be able to be taken care of by, uh, by our urgent care. So uh, how will we expand services? Uh, we will continue to engage community residents in um, uh, to, to sort of learn more as we go about their health needs and we'll use those relationships with the community to adapt and grow our, our uh, medical and our behavioral health services. We 
already know that we're going to do some expansions in a few areas. One is right now, nowhere on that campus do we take care of children or young mothers. And mm. we have every intention of, again, outpatient, which is where most of that care happens. Uh, we do plan to, um, uh, to provide new services for these young families. Good, good. Uh, We're uh, looking at you because that's what you guys do. And you don't have any services there for mothers. Mm -hmm. That's important. So mothers and families together. So, yeah, ex exactly. So that we're going to, there's we're gonna be a number of mothers and families together. Well, you're going to hear about how they're going to be able to come there for a variety of programming on the campus. Right now, uh, you can't get any me medical care for those folks. So we are going to be doing that. We're going to be doing that by adding family physician folks, uh, eventually perhaps pediatricians, but we can have uh, doctors who take care of all ages. Uh, so that is one area that we're planning on expanding to. We plan on expanding patient education programs to help people uh, take more control over their conditions. Uh, we're going to add community health workers. Community health workers uh, uh, to do uh, several things. One is to help people to help people navigate this extremely complicated health delivery system that we have. Community health workers can help uh, folks in the community do that navigation. On top of that, uh, we, uh, we know that community health workers can be a terrific uh, improvement in the communication between, between doctors and patients, sort of in between doctor visits, to sort of keep, keep folks on track and to keep doctors informed about how folks are doing. Um, we know that we're going to be expanding our medical care, we're going to be expanding our behavioral health services, and you're going to hear you know, much more in a few minutes about the things that are going to happen on, the, um, on this campus to take on the social determinants of, of health that we know are, um, that we, we know have such huge impact on people's health. Um, well, I guess I'm just, I will finish by telling you that I think most people feel safer if they live near a hospital or next to a hospital. It just, it just kind of makes sense. But I will also tell you that when this is studied, how close you are to a hospital really does not impact the health of an overall community um, or of individuals. That's true, that's true. You look around this city and every that's city true. in the country, sometimes the poorest health outcomes in the city right, right around them. I know what you're saying. are right next door to a hospital. So being next to a hospital uh, is not uh, anywhere near the predictor of actual health outcome, even though people kind of feel safer. What does impact, uh, clearly, a, an ongoing relationship with a primary care doctor has been shown to impact health uh, greatly. Mm -hmm. On top of that, many of the other things that, you're, that you'll be hearing about and that will develop on the, on the health campus for these social uh, uh, issues uh, also have a huge impact on people's health outcomes. And I'll, ju I'll just tell you that we, are, we, we know we can't do all this alone. We are already in conversations with our local federally qualified health centers who, uh, who have a great interest in collaborating with us to try to augment the services that we're going to do in that neighborhood. And we've, uh, we're already at the beginning of talking more to the other uh, the big health systems about ways that we can collaborate to meet folks' health needs in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good stuff. You were mentioning. Awesome. So I'm going to turn it over to Sue Cray, and Sue is going to actually talk about the health campus and the work that's been done with community engagement. And so I'm going to turn to Sue. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, inviting us here this morning to share, the, share our information. And as I indicated, um, I'm the president and CEO of the St. Vincent Charity Health Campus, um, which is a new organization that's designed to help bring these social determinants of health onto the health campus. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that this new organization is also led by a board chair, who's Robin Gordon, who happens to be the first African-American woman to ever be the director of operations at NASA Glenn Research Center. And she has a significant passion around this work that we are trying to do in order to lift this health campus. And so much of what you'll hear really builds on what both Jan and Dr. Garvin have shared with you um, of just the recognition that healthcare alone cannot make people healthy. That is this 80% the social determinants of health 
all the other factors, the social environment that we live in, our zip code, our housing, is inextricably linked to health. And that's what this health campus is really trying to address. So with your input, I'd like to, I'd like to share that we want to transform the Sisters of Charity property on East 22nd Street, including the hospital's main campus, because the sisters own a fair amount of property in that area, into a hub that will not only include the robust health care that we're talking about, but the social services and really an empowerment of the families and the residents to advance opportunities for the future. This is a time to really make a difference in the central neighborhood. And um, this, idea, uh, this idea really stemmed from clearly the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine, their mission, which they have stayed in this neighborhood since 1865, when many other organizations moved to the suburbs. They've been committed, and they've even asked the foundation to commit many resources uh, to this neighborhood, as I indicated um, before, around really continuing to improve health outcomes. It was really heightened by also not only knowing the data and the information about many inner city neighborhoods, but also the recognition how COVID elevated the recognition that so many members of our black and brown community had a disproportionate response to COVID and the health disparities became so evident um, from COVID and understanding redlining structural racism, which central neighborhood is probably one of the best examples of that in our community. So that recognition is really so aligned with our mission of really making a difference in this community. And then secondly, recognizing, as Jan has shared, the industry shifts of moving from inpatient to outpatient and COVID. There was underutilized space at St. Vincent Charity Medical Center. Mm -hmm. That hospital was built for 492 beds and it's not operating 492 beds today. So there was a recognition that we could integrate these social determinants of health and make them come alive on this campus as in a complementary way to robust ambulatory health services, which are now what we've announced this past uh, September. And so it was today more people want to receive health care in a way that helps them stay out of the hospital um, and to be healthier. And that's a good thing. And that's where trends are going. And that's what we really want to be uh, moving in that direction in order to really address uh, those needs for people. The goal is to improve health outcomes and to reduce health disparities <coughs> so we can really make a difference for our families and residents in the central neighborhood. So the health campus has been in development actually for several several years, and during which time we conducted a significant amount of research. We wanted to study this issue across the country, so we really wanted to understand how other initiatives like this were being put into use across the country. That helped us understand and helped us think about more clearly what we needed to do in order to lift the development of a health campus. We've engaged in lots of community dialogue to help inform the vision, and we really believe that the vision for the health campus Campus, needs to be co-created with the community. The community knows the answers to how to live healthier lives. We need to give them agency in order to learn that and then respond and build a health campus that is totally aligned with what their priorities are and what they see as important. And we also conducted outreach to potential partners and investors who are aligned with our mission and want to improve health as well. So um, we partnered with an organization in 2021, and perhaps many of you were aware of a organization called Mass Design, and they are a global um, nonprofit, which doesn't happen all the time for architectural and urban design firms. And they are dedicated to the living architecture that promotes justice, human dignity, and design for healing. Wow. And, and um, you know, they also were the organization that worked with Mr. Stevenson around developing the um, National Justice um, a memorial for lynching in Birmingham, in Alabama. And though I have not seen it personally, you know I understand that. it's one of the most incredible 
museums, and it's the only museum that acknowledges that tragedy in this country around yeah, lynching. Lynching, lynching. And so, um, and so that's the organization we brought, and they wanted to. Un they with them we began to undertake an extensive community engagement process, which began in, we announced it in June of 2021, and we began that process in 2021. And we employed a process of really early listening and engagement with the community, embedded in the local context, guided by local partners and leaders, and deeply informed by the lived experience of local residents. In fact, all of our committees associated with this project have residents sitting at the table. So we want to, um, we want to always share our power of how we're thinking about this health campus with residents to align that in a way um, that meets their needs and their priorities. So Mass Design Group and the Cleveland Central Promise Neighborhood, and Ms. Bunton is here today, and the Sisters of Charity conducted research and dialogue with residents and institutions in Central and also through the Greater Cleveland to understand directly from the community, what are the social and the economic needs that we should address on this health campus? And our team also connected with many project partners, internal stakeholders, local businesses, and the anchor institutions that surround this campus, community leaders to identify even more opportunities of how we can address the community identified needs. And so collectively, we conducted hundreds of instances and conversations where we had questions and answer sessions, workshops, facilitated conversations and events. We were trying to have Mass Design and us get to know the local context and the community through observation, bicycling, uh, scootering, walking neighborhoods, uh, photography, sketching, mapping, and participating in both local meetings and events. They even attended church services, went to Fresh Fest, et cetera. And we also recorded authentic narratives and emotions that people brought related to their lived experience that local residents were experiencing um, and even businesses in the central neighborhood and in the surrounding area. In total, the engagement ses sessions that Mass Design was a part of, and we did even far more than what Mass Design, they did 30 focus groups, 25 partner meetings, 15 guided tours, and five special events in order to inform their thinking about what how we might think about a health campus together with the community. They included social service organizations, primary care providers, youth development organizations, food security organizations, and champions, community gardeners, workforce development organizations, higher education leaders, foundation <coughs> leaders, real estate developers, public libraries, artists, and so many more, including public officials. We listened to the lived experience of neighbors, and we learned that in order to lead healthier lives, our community deserves spaces that nourish the mind, the body, and the spirit. For St. Vincent Charity Health Campus, truly unifying each space needs to establish, to establish an experience of radical welcome. And they spent a considerable amount of time defining from residents' lived experience what radical welcome looks like. And they developed maybe 25 different attributes of what that means and how we want to make that come alive in this health campus. The design and the design process also recognize our core values of seeking to serve the community with the broadest definition of health, including addressing the social determinants, poverty, racial segregation, and providing upward mobility. And the themes and the categories of programs that residents put on the table and said they would love to see the campus address, trauma and behavioral health was right up on the top. That's important. Food and nutrition, food insecurity, significant conversations around the reality of food insecurity in that neighborhood. The pl a place for youth and families to go to have safe space to connect with, another, with one another, to build social networks and find resources, critically important. Workforce development, 
but in a way that's different, that don't give us another program, help us access and support us in the workforce development space. Physical activity, the built environment, including the ability of a space to have physical activity, recreation space, green space to change a toxic environment, and places for spirituality and healing. Support for transportation, critical. Better housing opportunities, better learning and education opportunities, and there are a lot of artists in the central neighborhood who want an artist and an art and culture center, someplace where they can work in studios and exhibit their artistic talent. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know that Dr. Bascaro is going to talk about one of those, but our goal is that through the transformation of the hospital and the surrounding property owned by the Sisters of Charity, the St. Vincent campus will act as a catalyst to also bring about neighborhood revitalization. And so over the coming years, new New services, new programs and partners will be added alongside with the ambulatory community health services that Dr. Garvin and Jan are speaking about um, on this main campus and that there will be beneficial additions to all the services that we can bring into the future. And so we're committed to this future vision to the community. The Sisters of Charity Health System has established this, as I shared, this health campus as a new 501c3 um, nonprofit entity, and it's a part of our whole family of Catholic ministries. Um, the health campus will really take on a whole person approach. And that's really a fundamental essence of even the sisters' mission. They've recognized that you just can't deal with the healthcare needs, you gotta recognize the whole person and how they present to you. And actually the central neighborhood is now home to over six of the sisters' ministries that they operate in this neighborhood. And we've also worked with adjacent anchor institutions, and we've, we are proud to really share support from them around this St. Vincent Charity Health Campus. And our goals are in a way to better integrate our planning with their planning. Um, I've spoken to Mr. Patterson, uh, Ms. Bloomberg, and prior to Ms. Bloomberg, also, um, um, uh, uh, Mr. Sands, Harlan Sands, prior to his departure at Cleveland State University, mm -hmm. really around how we can all work together to really lift up the central neighborhood and improve the quality of life for the central neighborhood. And I also would be remiss if I didn't say that we have been really active in also working with the campus district, the CDC that this property is involved in, and Mr. Mark Lehman, as well as uh, Ms. Joy Johnson from Burton Bell Carr, neighborhood um, progress as Cleveland Neighborhood Progress as well as other community development organizations because we recognize when you talk about neighborhood revitalization there's a whole constituency that's also is dedicated and we want to be aligned with that as well. Can, can I say this? Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll wait till you get finished. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to in conclusion just say the transformation of the St. Vincent Charity Health Campus can really help shape and provide connectivity for all of our adjacent plans, making the site the critical long-term hinge point to connect Central and downtown and Greater Cleveland. You know how it's been bifurcated from the highway structure and um, where the juvenile court is located. It just isn't, it isn't pedestrian friendly to get downtown or to Midtown. If you walk that area, it's just, it's just been a bifurcated neighborhood um, from downtown. And so we hope that this will help it to really be a hinge point and to connect families to downtown. And starting in late um, November, we are again gonna go through an intensive community engagement to share our progress, our plans, where we are, talk a little bit more about the, the actual changes on healthcare services at St. Vincent Charity with the community and continue to involve the community deeply as we move forward with bringing programs and services to build out the health campus. And thank you for allowing us to share this. That, that was great, but let me say this. You missed one person. You have to work with him. Um, you know, if we, we went at the table, I, talk, I would talk about him. In another way, you have to work with your council member, uh, Richard Starr. Richard Starr, um, he's, he was, an, matter of fact, he's an activist in Central, 
Been an activist. He's one of our Trump. promise ambassadors. <laughs> okay, Star. okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. we've known him and had a long relationship with him. And, and on the health campus, you. we have worked with the community. In fact, one of the co um, um, Charmaine Jordan also is one of our uh, uh, community engagement committee co-chairs with Ms. Bunton. And um, I know that we've had some also conversations with him about juvenile court. And I know we could do more community engagement. And I do appreciate that comment. Yeah, because you know, think about Council Member Starr. He's from, Bo he's from the Boys and Girls Club Absolutely. also. Yes. So he understands your world, Sisters of Charity, evaluation processes, um, you, you include them in there. He understands the pre-testing, the post-testing, right. and he understands the people. Right. So when you do your survey analysis, he's out there talking with the people anyway. Absolutely. And, and, and that can help us out. And when um, also um, Jan, mm -hmm. President, yeah. uh, he's an MBA from um, Baldwin Wallace, which is one of the awesome. A great so, MBA yeah. school, and um, he understands strategic planning and strategy reviews. So when you do your strategic planning, yes. he would know how to do a SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, yes. threats, and you mentioned the trends. So Star, you have a young young guy, first guy. Matter of fact, he and I talk about the neighborhood sometime at 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. 4 a.m. in the morning. I'm serious, yeah. man. 4 a.m. in the morning. I just, you ask him when I, when I yield to him. Yeah. So he has that MBA. Yes. Use it. Yes. And he understands um, the way. He knows the way. You, you got to be baked in that right. fabric. Yes. And, and I just want to say I have grateful. such respect for Councilman. Young lady, you wanted to. And your name is what? Rashawn. And, and she's from you guys? Yes. She is the managing yes. director of yes. Cleveland Central Promise Neighborhood. Okay. And Regular day, and you can help me beat up Richard Starr if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add before Ms. Bunton speaks that we have such respect for Councilman Richard Starr. Right. I know I've been on conversations with him when he was at Boys and Girls Club. I got you. And the significant leadership role, mm -hmm. Councilman, that you've had with That's young good men and women at in the central neighborhood is bar none. Your passion, your commitment. It is. I know you much through Joe Black also, uh, who works closely yeah. with you, Sorry. as does Miss Bunton, and you are an incredible leader in that neighborhood. And he understands the um, strategic planning. You know, we sit and we talk a lot of yeah. technical things. So he understands, he knows the way. Gotta be based in the fabric. You raise your hand, young lady. Oh, thank and you. Your name Councilman. is Rashawn Bunting, um, managing director of Cleveland Central Promise Neighborhood, and now um, joining the team as a vice president of engagement with St. Vincent Charity Health Campus. And I wanted to speak to community engagement and um, our relationship first as. Central Promise Neighborhood with Councilman Starr um, and along his journey of leadership and just understanding, um, Councilman, you said it best, um, Councilman Starr should be, well, he not should be, but he is a part of uh, the fabric of the community. Councilman Starr and I have uh, a good relationship and we work closely with not just the youth in the neighborhood, but also community leaders in the neighborhood, having known that he was a leader much before his role as councilman, and understanding that here, moving here with the transition from um, my role in Cleveland Central Promise neighborhood, in addition to the health campus, Councilman Starr and his team um, will be integral, or are is integral, into the work that we do, not just for planning, but really just community outreach, really just understanding his vision, supporting his vision for the central community, and looking for ways in which we can partner better to help residents continue to thrive in the central community. So it has been a part of uh, my mission and my role as not just the vice president of community engagement, but my role is a supporting um, Central as by way of promise to always um, check in and hold a, a monthly meeting with Councilman Starr and his team and being very closely connected with the um, supports that come out of his or the supporting the programs that come out of his initiative by way of his role. So Councilman Starr and I have created a schedule where we meet okay. on a regular basis to make sure that 
our visions are aligned and we're supporting his initiatives and he's well informed about where we're going and how we are doing community outreach. Yeah, because he can help you with your survey analysis before you oh, introduce it to the, um, tremendously. You know, to the residents. He knows. We yes. talk about that. I'm going to yield to him in a second. Let me say this. Um, with your, the mayor and city council put aside $3.2 million two weeks ago. And we're putting together a committee to deal with art campuses and art districts around the city of Cleveland. And we use ARPA funding. So I didn't know, and I smile when you narrated with the campus, the structure about the arts. And I know that arts and dealing with um, cancer and other kind of diseases, you could, you could do uh, therapy. It's therapeutic. And so that if we, um, some kind of way, um, you know, you talk with the council member, he'll talk with me while we're putting together the system. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be um, a role model that we could look at or um, some kind of sample that we could look at because I think we put aside um, $3.2 million, okay, of, of funding, and that's going through um, city planning with Sue, um, Director Sue Hahn. And I'll be meeting with her next week. We're putting together structures and systems. In a sense, you, you're already um, Sisters of Charity with St. Vincent is working on um, putting together structure. We probably could be able to drop it right in Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Right, Absolutely. And, you, and you know where we're at. You know what I'm thinking with goals and objectives. And you have Councilman Starr that's there. His focus is on goals and objectives. And we probably can get some outcome from that. Because we're looking to create some art districts wow. in the city of Cleveland. Because, you know, art and health is directly correlated. And we have such champions that I know Councilman Starr knows about in the central neighborhood, Miss Garth and others, who so feel that there needs to be um, an emphasis on arts and culture in that neighborhood and have, feel that there's very little opportunity to do that. Did you bring your card with you? Um, I you know that I did, but I will be happy down. to give it we'll to you. We'll get it to you. Yeah. We'll All right, great, great, great. I'll get one this Next. afternoon. Greg, oh, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get Someone it to you. I'll you get it give to me, you. Know, stop yes. through. Because that's interesting so, when you said, I mean, everything you said, yeah. I'm there, but since we have well, dollars, we can move some things forward. Art and culture is also very healing and very spiritual, right? right? right, right. And it's another way of expressing yourself to help you in mind, body, and spirit. And sometimes we forget that. Mm -hmm. It's a very important... And you know, when I was going through my issues some years ago, um, you know, I was going through cancer, and I would sit in the, in the room, in the treatment room, oh. and practice my instrument. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. people were staring at the wall, and I'm sitting, taka, 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 little yeah. practice pad, mm -hmm. practicing, <laughs> and then the lady would come in and say, well, um, sir, yeah, you're finished with your um, treatment, but I wasn't saying, woe is me. Yeah. Let's give myself art therapy. I, wouldn't, mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. think about it. Yeah. I'm practicing on paradiddles, flamadiddles, and flamamacues, and yeah. all of that quietly. And it's, so it's correlated, and it helped me come out of it, mm -hmm. and I'm doing much better. Oh, and I was absolutely. in my third phase. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and so that's, that's when it opened my eyes when yeah. you mentioned that. Yeah. And Mr. Chairman, that's a good segue a great, into yep. Dr. Mike Biscara, who's talking Doctor. about one of the critical programs that the residents asked us to begin to think about with trauma and behavioral health. Thank you. Uh, appreciate um, this opportunity, really. Um, so, you know, I, I told you a little bit, you know, about my experience in the, in the field. Um, it, all of that experience has really um, fueled my passion for working with folks who are vulnerable and in need. Uh, in particular, people who experience, you know, serious and persistent mental illness and co-occurring addictions. Um, I'm glad you, you, you brought up how alternative therapy was helpful to you um, because, because, because we certainly know that there are many pathways for which people find recovery, and it's not always the traditional route, right, that people find it. Um, it might be through music, might be through art, might be through working with a horse or an animal. So there are a lot of different ways um, that, that people can experience um, wellness and recovery. Um, I'm hoping to talk with you a little bit about what our vision is for some of the growth on campus and behavioral health. Um, you heard a little bit about um, what I would say the traditional treatment services have been on campus, um, acute care um, into you know, outpatient traditional behavioral health care, but um, we're really looking at you know, expanding that. Why would we do that? Well, 
We know um, that every day, Northeast Ohioans, Clevelanders are struggling to get the care that they need. I'd venture to say that if not um, our own, if it's not one of us that has been ourselves impacted by mental health or addiction, we certainly, and the, and the data will say that one in five of us will, right? One in five of us will experience a diagnosable uh, behavioral health condition at some point in our lives. But we most definitely know, we most definitely know somebody who has had either a mental health issue or an addiction or both. Um, so this is an important issue. Um, rates of depression um, are increasing, um, anxiety increasing, um, you know, suicide is increasing in certain age groups, and um, overdose continues to be on the rise, right? Um, nearly half of adults who experience mental illness you don't receive treatment. Um, minorities and marginalized individuals access treatment two to three times less the rate of the general population. You know, resource, uh, stigma is a big problem. Resources are stretched very thin. Um, there's a lot of social isolation, despair, and chronic stress that really continue um, to grow, exceeds one's ability to cope, and we have a state of, of crisis. Historically, law enforcement, um, hospitals, and jails have been um, and remain the first line of defense for people experiencing behavioral health crisis. And this is really not okay. We have to do better. Every person in crisis and their families deserves a humane um, response that treats them with dignity and respects and connects them to appropriate and timely care. Council, uh, Chairman, you, you shared your experience with cancer, all right? Imagine um, if our loved ones or yourself with, with cancer or even other health care conditions had to wait, you know, 30 days for an assessment. Um, they didn't know where to go when they were, they didn't, they didn't know where to go when they were seriously ill. Um, or they received the wrong care response when, when they were in that medical crisis. Um, yeah, this, um, this happens um, frequently to those um, with mental health and addictive disorders. It doesn't mean that we don't have good programs out there. It doesn't mean that we don't have great resources available and a lot of supports. Um, it just means that we need to figure out a better way to sort of bring it all together so people ha know who to call, um, they know who's going to respond, and they, they, they know where to go um, when they're having these particular issues. Uh, the community engagement that Sue talked about that we did with Mass Design really showed and highlighted the need um, um, for um, support and coping with trauma and violence, especially in central and underserved uh, neighborhoods. Residents in the community identified behavioral health as a long-standing and significantly under-addressed need, a need that has been made worse by COVID, right? It's been worsened, um, and Jan talked quite a bit about that at the beginning. Um, you know, this, this, our health campus, we really are seeking to create a new coordinated response to crisis in the community and enhance um, services that are available to people um, longer term and help them with their recovery. Recovery does not end um, after a hospitalization, um, after um, an intensive outpatient treatment program, or a residential stay. Um, recovery is lifelong for many folks who are um, uh, dealing with behavioral health um, needs and conditions. So what we're looking to do is really expand um, the mental health and addiction crisis continuum by partnering with community entities in developing a crisis and recovery services pilot. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a couple, in a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. But really, partnership uh, and true coordination with systems of care is key. Um, we, really have to fig we really have to figure out how to bring all of the resources together and how to bring all the resources together in a coordinated way that can, can meet needs um, when people need them. And when, that, just, which, when you do your strategic planning, right? You yeah. take a look at that. Absolutely. Where every quarter, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, no, no. but you got me excited because it's correlating <laughs> with you, yeah. both yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry. No, no, no. I got no, excited no, about it. it. 
it's, it, I'm glad, it, it's, this is a great thing to be excited about and I wish we were all excited about it. And, we, and, and this is really the opportunity, the opportunity of a lifetime to really do this right. So I uh, appreciate your excitement and support. But you know, the community organization and, and residents that we've talked to have really um, voiced um, a desire to integrate behavioral health into health and social services and vice versa, to integrate other services and supports into behavioral health. So we engaged several focus groups with senior executives across health systems, agencies, insurance companies, and consumer and policy advocates, as well as experienced frontline staff, so people on the front lines providing mental health and addiction services. There were some unanimous things that we heard from all of those individuals. Our county's behavioral health infrastructure is threatened by poor communication, lack of coordination, and parity between medical and behavioral health. Right, we passed parity a long time ago and we're still not seeing that in, in, our, in, in the behavioral health um, world. Minority and marginalized communities are impacted significantly by services just not being sensitive to their needs, not being um, as culturally informed as they can be. And I know um, Scott and the Adams Board have been working really hard on making sure our service continuum um, is um, culturally sensitive, informed, and, 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 and providing um, um, services that are appropriate to people's needs. Uh, providing support uh, to individuals leaving emergency departments and helping guide them to the next level of care and recovery would alleviate a major problem in the, in the current system of care. So those were the three big things that those folks that we talked to said, right? We need better coordination, less fragmentation. Um, we need services that are sensitive to people's needs. Um, and we need to really have more services that provide um, support to people as they leave our emergency departments and what I would call the critical time service entities. So jails, our own diversion center, places like that. We need to really work on a nice fabric um, that helps people get from one level of care to the next. Uh, oh, stop right there real quick. Yes. You mentioned, you said better care, then you went IE with the different things that we're over in the city and the county. You mentioned those um, key points. Can you Say that again. You mentioned a different divergence center. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so, what, what we're, what we're, what we're, want, what we're thinking of doing, right, is provide, and what, what these folks that we've talked to have said is really to provide support to individuals leaving emergency departments, leaving these other, other critical time service entities, and helping guide them to their next steps in recovery, their next place in care would really alleviate a major problem. So, um, for example, someone comes to our psych emergency department uh, at St. Vincent's and, you know, they're not admitted to the hospital or admitted to, to a hospital. Um, um, they're given a referral um, and they may or they may not follow up. We really need to do a good job of ensuring that people get to that next level of care. And when people are in crisis and when, when they're struggling, um, we maybe can't expect um, all of those things of them that we might expect of somebody else who's not having those conditions. That's what I meant. Okay. Really no, cre no, no, there. creating more wrap around services. Um, what I kind of call that sticky help, um, what I've heard someone, uh, what I, I heard this once, uh, Tom Craig from the Pegs Foundation, uh, he talked, to, he uses this great term called sticky help, and I think it's a really great way to think about the support that people need as they go from one level of care, care to the next. Anyway, these, these community insights really helped form our vision for the Health Campus Crisis and Recovery Services pilot. Um, and really, it's important, because some of these things that we were talking about, really the most effective uh, system of care for behavioral health crisis uh, combines a coordinated call system. So think air traffic control. Um, if you think about our healthcare system, and especially, um, but in particular, the behavioral health system as a um, kind of a, you know, the radar screen and, and all of the providers are the different planes, we need to have somebody that's kind of controlling and sort of navigating that. We need to have an appropriate mobile response, and we certainly have a mobile crisis response, um, and, and that's important to have in a, in a continuum of care. We also need to have safe um, receiving centers when people are uh, in times of crisis, like our diversion center, like our psyche D, but we could certainly probably have, have more. Um, during times of behavioral health crisis, right, people need someone to talk to, um, they need someone to provide assistance to them and respond, and they need a safe place to go. This, this approach 
decreases the use of jails, law enforcement, emergency departments, first responders, and hospitals. It, it decreases the use of those things and really results in better care uh, provided in the least restrictive and, and lower cost setting. So what we're thinking of doing on campus initially in our first year um, with this behavioral health crisis and recovery services pilot is to really work on crisis outreach, prevention, and management efforts to assist individuals that are struggling when they're most vulnerable. We want to build capacity to provide virtual and community-based, meaning going out to them, going out to where people are um, versus waiting for them to come to us and provide a response for mental health and substance abuse crisis. Years two and three, we want to expand our team and grow in that. Um, obviously, this is a pilot, right? The point of a pilot is to see how it works, um, to iron out all the kinks, um, and to make sure you're doing something that's really going to benefit the community. Um, we're going to employ licensed professionals. Um, we're going to employ peer recovery supporters, people with lived experience, because um, one of the things that we know is that if you've been there and done that, that can make a significant impact on people um, and, their, and increasing their desire and motivation to seek treatment. Um, also, deploying case management staff um, that can, again, that can go out to where folks are, whether it's an emergency room um, um, or, or their home or another setting and respond to them and provide them help so they can get to where they need to go. Um, again, also connecting with criminal justice and those other critical time service entities that I talked to you about, hospitals, homeless shelters. So the new team is going to have to be trauma-informed, really adept at working with community partners. We can't do this alone, um, and we don't need to be duplicating services, so we need to connect with the people that are doing things well and work closely with them to, to, to meet the need. And we're going to offer ongoing time unlimited. Um, everything in healthcare is time sensitive, um, so we really want to kind of lay kind of this blanket of service on people for as long as they need it um, and provide recovery-oriented services that really help folks um, at a time of need that are experiencing these serious and persistent mental illnesses and co-occurring addictions, trauma, and oftentimes medical comorbidities. Um, you know, care can't Care needs to and cannot end uh, at a hospital ED or discharge from a facility. So again, using um, a community-based case management approach, our pilot is going to do a few things. We want to successfully link individuals to care. A referral um, is not enough, and all too often, and Scott and, and we all know this in, in the business, that all too often we lose people in these care transitions. So when they leave the psych ED, when they leave these other places that are time sensitive in nature. And we need to improve engagement. We want to improve uh, engagement both pre and post crisis. If we can prevent crisis from, crises from happening altogether, that's a good thing. We want to focus on our individuals who are at risk of rehospitalization um, and that require more treatment than what um, traditional treatment can offer, meaning just medication and therapy. Um, these individuals that we're talking about are going to require more support than that. Um, and improve retention uh, in treatment, enhance care, and improve longer term recovery outcomes. Those are the main things that we're, we're really looking to do. Truly, our, our vision here is, is for people to have access to a visible, accessible, and responsive crisis recovery continuum of care. Our health campus crisis and recovery services will provide uh, the right care at the right time, and it's intended to reduce the need for costly, intensive levels of care and help individuals live healthier, more productive, and meaningful lives. Who doesn't want to do that? Right? I mean, that's the point. Um, that's good, Doctor. I mean, that's good. Is that, is that the point? That, that, that is the point. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity. And if you have questions, we're happy to, to answer any of you that you have. Yeah, I'm going to yield to Scott in a quick second. And then I have to yield to my um, colleagues. Um, I like that um, paper. Are you going to share that with us? Because in there, you were narrating um, systems and structures. Yeah. and how it, um, it can connect with other key stakeholders and partners mm -hmm. in your, um, when you were narrating that to us. And you also was narrating how we can measure outcome measures. And you also talked about um, um, time, time constraints when you um, 
you know, some people fall, fall through the cracks. Yeah. So we need to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks. So we need to create some kind of systems or structures in there. And with your presentation, you can create some policy off of that. Mm -hmm also how to connect with the um, city of Cleveland as well as with the, um, the county, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, I mean, any, anything that That's we, a good presentation. Yeah, anything that we can do to make, make a really good system, um, you know, even better and save lives, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. How to monitor and control it, all of that was in there. Um, that was, that was that's some good, I like, it was good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Scott. Yes. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to say, right, that St. Vincent's is an integral part of the crisis continuum of care, right? But I also wanna say we do have a crisis continuum of care. What St. Vincent's is trying to do is a good thing, right? But they can't do it by themselves, right? There's other, other community organizations and other hospitals trying to do the exact same thing, but people aren't talking together. But actually we were before the pandemic. So there were different things that we were talking about that Metro Health brought together. We all developed a uh, intercept mapping um, sort of thing, you know, where people go into crisis and where you can intercept them and with the justice system and things like that. So, um, so this has been talked about for a while. Right. Second of all, I want to say that the, the, the Adams board, right, oversees the crisis continuum of care, right? We have the 24 hour hotline that people call and, and find out information. We are overseeing the diversion center, which was established by the county. Uh, we responded to an RFP along with uh, Oriana House and Frontline Service to develop the diversion center. And I just have to say that St. Vincent's did have an opportunity um, to operate the diversion center. So I, I just wanna put that out on the table, okay? Uh, also that we also have a, uh, a crisis stabilization unit that we operate, uh, the diversion center. We also fund also um, uh, crises, uh, no, uh, mental health, behavioral health, urgy centers with the centers. Um, so there, there are a lot of opportunities for people who are in crisis. We won various campaigns throughout the entire city on radio, direct service campaigns for letting people know that that is where they need to go to get, you know, into our system. Right, so I just wanna say that. Also in the future, uh, well, we've also hired a consultant after the, you know, the initial um, announcement from St. Vincent, we have hired a consultant, Dr. Catherine Burns, who is well known throughout the state and actually throughout the country as well. And she is gonna be working with us and looking at our crisis continuum of care, right? So the Adams board knew that, you know, right now, it, it, the, if there was the, um, fact or whatever that if the psychiatric emergency would go away right now that we needed to, to do something with that, right? So that's why we're working with psychiatric, uh, St. Vincent's, the psychiatric emergency department on that, right? I, I know that Dr. Briscaro, you know, you mentioned a lot of people that you've got together with and I know you've met with us, but the Adams board hasn't been involved with those conversations. So that's, that's kind of missing, right? Uh, Dr. Fowler will tell you too that he, he's saying that we need to get together with all the area hospitals as well, right? We know Metro Health has just opened their new psychiatric hospital, right? And we are also planning to fund some portion of their um, psychiatric emergency department as well that they would like to. You know, they're far east, St. Vincent's is centrally located. There's a whole lot of issues, right? And, and the need is there, right? People need it. I mean, we see it with people going to the diversion center as well. And the diversion center acts as an entrance point. It's not only diversion from police, it's diversion from further crisis. So actually the more referrals that we're getting are from self-referrals or people from family and friends. And the diversion center is voluntary and it's a place where they could go, right, to receive a formal um, assessment and linkage to services and get, you know, crisis stabilization, all sorts of things uh, in addition to detox. So, you know, that Rosary Hall, they will, they will no longer have inpatient detox, but our um, diversion center has 16 beds for, um, uh, for detox, so that's a good thing that we have, you know, as well. Um, so, so I just, you know, want to say that the Adams Board it should be the convener of all of these things, and, and we are working towards that. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Metro Health did did their thing. St. Vincent's is doing their things. We have other things doing it. And I just want to say that last night at our board meeting, we introduced our uh, our budget 
for uh, behavioral health services in Cuyahoga County, and we're proposing $96 million that we are putting towards all of the services uh, that there are in Cuyahoga County with over 70 providers operating in different parts of the city, all providing different parts of services. So, you know, so yes, we are supportive of, a matter of fact, there's um, some money that we are putting in also to Dr. Pescaro's plan. I know he's received funding from other places um, as well. So just want to say that we want to work with more with the city. That's one of those things that we are working on. And we also want to work more with the in, entire system, right? You know, we oversee the entire system, uh, recovery support services uh, and, and uh, you know, things like that. So I'm just saying that, you know, we support St. Vincent's, um, but the community really needs to get together then in all of this. And that's why we have our consultant working with us. And in 2023, uh, you know, because right now, you know, we're working through things and 2023 is going to be a, a real in, uh, important year of us looking at is St. Vincent going to be able to still continue to provide the services in the psychiatric emergency department, or maybe it's a different um, uh, a different name, as well as we'll be looking at Metro Health as well. How, do, how does their new hospital and new psychiatric emergency department fit into all of this? So we'll be bringing the community together as well to talk about, you know, maybe there's a, a different way, um, you know, uh, of, of doing things. D Dr. Bob, did you want to add? I want to yield over to you, Council Member, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. for the question first. Yeah, yeah, I do have, I do have you down. I have, um, right, 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 right. That's I know right. that, but thank you very much. I'll just let him know before he says something. I just wanted to reinforce what Scott said. Um, we at the Adams, we're looking forward to coordinating the effort uh, all throughout 2023, because like Scott said, 2023 is going to be a critical year. Um, personally, I sort of look at our funding for 2023 is a Band-Aid on the problem. So we need long-term solutions, and we're ready, willing, and able to, to lead those solutions. And one other thing, Mr. Conwell, you mentioned uh, state advocacy. Right. Might I recommend, uh, hopefully, that we join forces in that advocacy program? Um, everybody here uh, from the various institutions, you folks from the city, maybe the county, maybe even Ohio Moss, uh, get together, join forces, and approach the governor that way. Yeah, I used to, um, and, and Scott, no, uh, with uh, my wife and I, Yvonne, you know, she's county representative, we used to, um, but Scott, you haven't reached out to us, but it's okay. Um, we would go down there to advocate, talk with some of the state reps, state senators for funding for the um, Adams board, and so... We're still open to you. Yes, and, and that, that it hasn't stopped. It's just that COVID, you oh, know, yeah, yeah, COVID, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, that was, it, that was a different too, reason too, why we sorry. don't have buses going down and things like that. And then we also belong to the Ohio Association of County Behavioral Health Authorities, and they're really integral part of, of working on the budgets and the whole voices mm -hmm. of all the behavioral health boards throughout the state uh, working together. Yeah, 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 you know, I have your phone number. I call yeah. you from oh, time yeah. to time. And oh, all we, the time, right? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. do, all the time. And we yeah. discuss things, not even just at the table. Sure. We talk about you guys and everybody. And um, mm -hmm. Scott, you're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. I'm there, matter of fact. Um, we're going to bring you to the table, probably do a joint hearing with um, the safety committee. Okay. And uh, we'll try to figure out what we can do to work and not just have hearings, but have outcome measures from the hearings. Yes. Um, to help out, to work with um, Sisters of Charity and all of that, dealing with the mental health. Mm -hmm. And we have some issues. So your name come up okay. a billion times okay. in Adam's <laughs> board. <laughs> yes. And then we talk about the co-responder teams and care response teams. And, yeah, there's a whole... There's a whole lot of stuff and a, a lot of good stuff going on and a lot of things that we're looking forward to doing in the future, too. Yeah, I even talk about Scott. My, uh, you know, my wife is county council rep, <laughs> and uh, we, we would talk about the Adams board, and I pick up the phone sometime at night, 7 or 8 o'clock, and just call Scott up and say, Scott, what's going on with this and that, man? <laughs> so, 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 so we got the phone, and then we talk about it. So he's, he's really um, good. His uh, phone is open. So here's Chairman Slife. He's also mentioned to bring you guys in mm -hmm. with the Adams board. So we'll go into more yes. extensive with that because we yes. really care, but we want to do some outcome measures that you just mentioned, Doctor. Yes. Saying that, 
I want to yield to um, Council Member Richard Starr from Ward 5. Thank you very much. Councilman. Oh, you're going to leave, Chair? Um, uh, <laughs> I'm messing with you. You know I got to mess with you. Um, I, say that, um, I say that because Chairman um, Conwell did mention how we have these late night discussion, early morning discussion, and I'm trying to figure out how old he is for him to be up this late or early in the morning with me um, trying to figure out what we're doing as far as um, legislators as a body, um, getting our ideals, conveying them amongst each other to figure out how we can support organizations. So um, just a few questions that I definitely want to make sure I bring to the table. Um, thank you, um, Co-Chairman Slife and Chairman Conwell for um, having this committee, this special hearing, something that we talked off the record about um, figuring out how we could do something. And just to piggyback off y'all, today I do got on one of my National Boys and Girls Club of America um, ties that I got for a gift for some different services from our former president, Ron Soder, um, some years ago. So today was a good day for me as far as thinking about the youth. But some of the questions I definitely wanted to just tap into is, um, with the changes of St. Vincent's and St. Charity, chair to the table, um, what effect does it have on those employees um, as far as the process goes for them gaining employment? And then also talking about that severance package. Is there something in place? And then also piggybacking, extending more um, depth on that question would be, um, what happens from them trying to transition from a unionized hospital or being in a union um, with St. Vincent St. Charity and they're going to another agency um, with the support of St. Vincent St. Charity where they're not union. You know, one of the things that, I'm, that I've been sleeping on and just thinking about is, you know, if, if I worked for, you know, I did 14 and a half years with Boys and Girls Club, so I may start making some money a little bit, right? Um, over the years, you, you've moved up into different positions. Um, um, got a higher salary, what does that happen to that employee when they seek employment or they get hired in for other agencies such as a Cleveland Clinic, Metro, UH, like do I start back at the $18 or do I keep my salary? Do I still have my tenure? What happens to those employees? And then one, um, I know November 15th was a, a, a date that we said things were changing. What effects does that have? Do they have to the 15th? Or is some people are being let go as recent as early as December? September um, due to just the cuts. You know, so those, some of those things I would just like the table um, to speak to. And, and, and pr prior to responding, just, just for a little bit of reference, we typically give each member about 15 minutes to ask questions. Uh, so the, there's a number of questions at the table. So uh, the, the goal is to strike a balance between thorough but uh, concise mm -hmm. so that we can get through our lines of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. No, thank you very much, and thank you. Councilman Starr, really, we thank you for all your support. So let me talk about, you know, where we're at. Uh, the mic, with, the with mic's the on the people at home. Oh, sorry. Yep. And um, so, uh, as you know, um, we have uh, two unions at St. Vincent's ONA and SIU. And candidly, I can't talk really more about that. You know, there, there are negotiations going on. You know those are confidential. Yes. Um, but our commitment is to our caregivers, regardless of where they're represented. And we are following the collective bargaining unit, you know, the, the contracts that we have in place. So that's, that's number one. On the employees, so many of our employees have been at St. Vincent's for a very long time, so your point is very well taken. 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, that's a big change. What we did, we did a number of things. Number one, we spent time with employees helping them, you know, write a resume, fill out an uh, application, how do you interview, because we know they, they haven't done that in a long time. The response from the community in terms of agencies that wanted to come into St. Vincent's was over overwhelming. So we had over 30 different agencies. Um, I will call out UH in a very special way with Dr. Majerian, who's the system CEO. And he really came forward to me and said, Jan, if we get um, staff from St. Vincent's, 
We will honor their seniority. So whatever their seniority is, they would, that would go with them. Uh, they will do everything they can to have parity with their salary so they don't take pay cuts, but also, and also to have parity with their benefits. So that was really a very, they, they really didn't have to do that, but they did. And so we're very grateful for that. Um, I know everyone is wanting to know, so where <coughs> did everybody land? And we won't know that probably until early December. And when we do, I'll bring that back to you. I'm, I will share where individuals went. Yes, the staff have to make their own decision about where they want to go. And there are obviously organizations that support collective bargaining, and so they have that option. So that's where we're at right now today. Some staff uh, are, have really made a commitment to stay till the end of the year in certain clinical areas so that we can continue to take care of patients. There are others that have made the decision that they are going to look for other opportunities, and they're doing that every day. Every morning at St. Vincent's, we have a safety huddle at 8.30 in the morning. I'm there with the staff from St. Vincent's, and we're actually looking at number of patients we have, how many individuals of our staff have made a decision to seek other employment, because under all of this, we have to keep all of our patients safe. And so there's time when we really have to combine you know, units where we put patients together so that we can staff it appropriately. But that's being looked at every single day. And um, we love our caregivers. I have to tell you, you know, having been there during COVID, uh, they, they were amazing and they were heroic. And I mean, every level of the organization, they came in every day. And you know, early on in COVID, we did not know what we didn't know. We had no vaccines. We didn't know what we were fighting. And they, they really did. And an amazing job. Right now, we believe for the services that Dr. Garvin and Dr. Biscaro talked about, uh, we'll have roughly 100 FTEs left on the campus, and uh, the remaining 600, and I want to say 41, are the individuals that are looking for other opportunities right now. Thank you. Thank you. 100 will actually you know, be on the campus, and then 641 is the, the last number. Now, that, that number changes constantly, but that's uh, what we were working with. Thank you. Um, um, Chair, to the to council staff, can we make a note to get that update on staffing for yeah. December so we can have a follow-up discussion? Um, something else that I would just wanted to reiterate, um, with the with St. Vincent Charity downsizing, what effects does that have on other healthcare um, organizations? You know, so it's an excellent question, Councilman. So really, if you just as Sue said, you know, in a, in a time, you know, years ago, St. Vincent's was a 492 bed hospital. Um, when I actually came to St. Vincent's, our average daily census was 120. After COVID, the day that we made the announcement of the transition, our census was 39. 39 patients with 600 and some FTEs. Actually, closer to 700 if you talk about the 100. So just looking at that dynamic, you can understand that our census really has substantially dropped. And if you look at the, I, I would just call your attention to the Center for Health Affairs and their data, you can actually look by inpatient, outpatient, emergency room visits, and you can look at all the hospitals and see, and St. Vincent's really has suffered the most in terms of losses in volume. Yes, and um, just want to make something clear on record. I know I did some research, and I see that you've been running in a rare deficit for about the last 10 to 12 years. Um, so this was part of the reason why I chaired to the table um, to Ms. President Murphy, rather, um, why you had to make this decision to downsize some of the services. When we could not, you know, financially, we could not get to a sustainable, you know, level of functioning. And so, and we had hoped for that before COVID. In June of 2020, the losses at St. Vincent were 27 million. Um, that, if you continue, you know, that extrapolation of losses, it put all the other ministries that the sisters have at risk, in, including some very significant issues around there. They have elder care facilities, so Regina Health Center in Ridgefield and Lida Hartsville in Bedford. And so we really had to make the tough decision of how do we stem the losses. The, it's very hard, um, and I think we all know this, looking at what's gone on in healthcare, to be a standalone 
Catholic hospital in a city like Cleveland with giants surrounded by giants. And, and I'm not being critical, they just are. You know, you have, we couldn't compete with Cleveland Clinic or UH or Metro. Now they, I want to underscore, they just like the Adams Board have been wonderful to us and worked with us during COVID. We could not have gotten through COVID without the help of the Cleveland Clinic helping us with testing and UH with the, obviously taking, helping our employees. Uh, and we've always been partners with uh, Metro in whatever way we can be. So again, you know, a lot of change, but again, to try and keep managing that kind of loss um, was just becoming impossible. Yes, and, and I understand. I think my colleagues understand, um, you know, the budget when you're losing money and, and you're not able to uh, have a surplus. Sometimes that makes a tough decisions to happen. Um, and I just want to make sure the residents um, are not, a, has an effect on them. One of the things that I think about when I grew up um, living in War 5, grew up in King Kennedy, um, one of the things that we always knew was get to St. Vincent, St. Charity, or if you need anything. You know, because it's within walking distance. Um, when you think about War 5 and you think about the central community, um, there's about nine public housing estates. Um, most of the residents in the central neighborhood, a vast, large majority of them do not have uh, reliable transportation other than public um, RTA transport. So now I'm trying to think about, you know, when something happened, and I know numerous people when it was life or death, um, if they make it to St. Vincent St. Charity, and life was if they made it there because the medical field, the EMS unit, played a real role. So I'm trying to figure out when you downsize, and I know we were mentioned earlier that there's going to be an urgent care coming into the EMS unit. Um, I would like to see how that looks, and I also would like to piggyback to the county. Um, I know that there's this big discussion about the county jail um, and those different things that are coming on. Um, I know that in 2019 there was a contract that happened and Metro, I believe, was rewarded to that contract. Is there some way to create some conversation, dialogue, bidding, um, possible process to figure out how we can connect the services? Because obviously, um, if there's some way that the county or Metro can um, honor that contract for them to come into St. Vincent St. Charity, I think that can help sustain that EMS unit. The reason why I say that is when you look at the way our city is structure, you know, you got Metro on West 25th, yes. then you got UH on Euclid, but when you talk about central part of, of, of the city, you're talking about Ward 5. And the reason why central, you got five different other wards that is on the borderline of Ward 5, from downtown, Ward, 3rd, Ward 3, Ward 7, Ward 12, Ward 6, Ward 2, and 4. They all touch us. They all touch as War 5. So when you think about not just War 5 residents, but just residents and individuals in the city of Cleveland, when you downsize from an EMS unit and you start just going with certain outpatient work, it has a major role on not just residents of War 5, but the city of Cleveland. So I would like to make a note. Um, I did talk to staff about trying to figure out some way to work together because I know that we got this health campus um, implementation and we got that coming up and we do got a meeting on the calendar um, for us to discuss with mass design and other leaders but one of the things that I have a hard pill swallowing is having a discussion about a health campus when we just downsize St. Vincent St. Charity and residents pay attention to that and I want to make sure once we um, come up with whatever plans that we're trying to accomplish with the health campus, it shows some support when it comes to that different trauma unit. Mm -hmm. Like I said, when, when someone gets shot in the neighborhood that I represent, um, a lot of people don't have that sense of transportation and they rely on 911 EMS to get them to the units. I believe there was um, some numbers shown that last year about 3,900 visits from EMS unit was taking place to there. So it was like, where, where do those individuals go? Where do, they, where do they get the services they need? Even though sometimes you gotta get life flighted, but you start to get, you know, maintain some treatment. And then I'd just like to ask one final um, thought, suggestion before co-chair look at me one more time. Um, it's life, um, the, just to, to make sure I get the understanding is, what is the services that are being provided currently in the EMS unit from St. Vincent's to Charity, and where do we go from there to make sure, sure we understand? It's an excellent question. I'll defer to Dr. Garvin. So the, uh, 
I, EMS trips to St. Vincent Charity are not even uh, close to 3,900. That's total people who came in for anything. Okay. So those are, most of those folks walked in or drove in. EMS did not bring them. Okay. Um, many, many of the things that were uh, the, the, the life and death uh, saves that could happen at St. Vincent Charity Hospital decades ago that I also remember very well um, have not happened in quite some time. What's, what has we've really learned over time is that there are centers of excellence for care of emergencies, whether that emergency is a gunshot wound or a horrible car accident or a stroke or a heart attack, and they all have uh, uh, actually countywide um, systems for where to get those folks as fast as you can get them there. But we know that they have different kind of time limits. So if you're having a heart attack, the time you have to get to the right place is, nine, is 90 minutes. So you have to be within 90 minutes of a place that can do the right procedure, the right to open up an artery. If it's a stroke, you gotta be there within three, uh, you gotta have that, that procedure within three hours. If it is a major trauma, we, we have learned is that it's not to go to the nearest emergency department, it is to get to a trauma center within the first 60 minutes golden hour. So, um, so EMS, if, if somebody is, is in a horrible car accident um, or a burn or, uh, or, or shot um, in Central, and EMS picks them up, they're driving right, they have been for a long time, driving right past Charity to uh, either Metro or UH or one of the other trauma centers. So how uh, community-wide, we take care of the most critical, serious things has moved over time to fewer places that do it all the time and not just to the nearest facility. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then my last question is just the messaging, um, the communication, like this change is going in effect um, with less than three, less than four weeks from now. Um, what, where are we at with the communication to making sure um, residents in the city of Cleveland know um, clearly of these changes? Um, I know I always think I always speak of the folks and the residents in Skyline Towers who who maximize all of the services that are offered in St. Vincent St. Charity, making sure they understand um, what the downsizing looks like, where they can get the services, and then also talk about if there's any sense of transportation. Because a lot of the residents over there in the neighborhood used to walk, you know, literally walk uh, right across the street, and, and you can get to the, the gift shop, you can get um, physical, you can get anything taken care of. How does that look for those folks and those individuals going forward? So, Councilman Starr, I just uh, uh, underscore your same concerns, and we, we have a tremendous team here with communication and a plan, and we'll make sure that as that gets developed that we work with you so that you see that and you're included in that. Um, there's no doubt that we have to have that, and we have to we have to communicate in ways that it's meaningful for the neighborhood. So, you know, they like word of mouth. They like to hear from their own yep. staff. They like, they loved your town hall meeting. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to use all those modalities to get that message out. And we'll have to continue it because it's an evolution. And so, but what we want them to know is what are the basic facts to your point? You know, if, if this happens to me, where do I go? Yes. And, and that is really, really important. And I think as the health campus develops, I think that there's going to be more and more opportunities to have those discussions and again, to help educate because healthcare is going to continue to change. We just want to make sure that people get to the right level of care in the right amount of time, as Dr. Carbon talked about, so that we can make sure that they stay healthy and you know have the best outcome possible, high quality. So we'll continue to work on that. We'll include you. And again, our communication team, I know Sue mm -hmm. leads that up with Rebecca and the team. And so we'll continue to work on that and share that with you. OK, and, and last thing, Co-Chair, and I'm finished. Um, um, a trauma unit, like I think that is something needed in Central. Um, a lot of crime goes on, and and.
trauma, a lot of trauma goes on and happens in the, in the neighborhood and we're fighting to try to curb that violence. Um, but the reality is if we're about to make a change to the, with a health campus, I think we should be having a discussion about bringing the trauma unit to Central to make sure that EMS unit is, is really back to where it started back in the 1800s when you had all those beds that were filled um, or available if need be. Um, so I think that's something we need to um, possibly explore. And I know we'll talk in our upcoming meeting, I believe, next week. I yell, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Starr, and thank you for your continued advocacy. I, I know that uh, people throughout the Cleveland, <coughs> excuse me, people throughout Cleveland are uh, uh, really anxious about uh, the, the closure of inpatient services at St. Vincent, but that, that's particularly uh, uh, felt in your community. So, so thank you for your continued advocacy. Um, I have a number of things, and, and time is short. Um, so one thing, and, and this is something, if we could work on this and provide this information to staff, um, as it comes to the health care campus, and the new services that are provided. I am interested in understanding kind of the intersection of the Sisters of Saint Ch uh, Sisters of Charity Health System and the foundation and, and understanding how those services are going to be funded, how the closure of inpatient services does that free up dollars uh, in order to provide those services. I feel that that's a, a big topic and something that is part of our ongoing conversation. So I would just ask that let's not, let's not focus on that today, but know that I think that that is going to need to be a, a, a crucial component of the continued conversation. Um, you know, just to address an elephant in the room, um, just zooming out macro, regional, uh, you know, we've seen the closure of uh, a multitude of hospitals in Cleveland and, and Cuyahoga County Urban Core, East Cleveland, Lakewood, and, and even recently uh, the closures of UH facilities in Richmond Heights and Bedford, and, and I, I think it's, it, it we, we, we all recognize that, you know, healthcare is an industry, healthcare follows insurance, people with insurance have a tendency to live in outlying suburbs and, and look a lot like me, and, and uh, the, uh, there's a lot that we need to do societally to push against this uh, perverse incentive for healthcare systems to deny coverage to neighborhoods uh, where people don't look like me. And, and I'm not saying that that is what is happening in this mm -hmm. case, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I, when, when going up to the balcony and looking down at the floor and seeing how systems are occurring, uh, this is certainly a part of that. Um, so with that, um, I am interested in understanding how you are going to be, just could you suss out a little more how you're going to be connecting people into these new, whether it, it's coming into an urgent care, going to a primary care physician, Dr. Garvin, you were my doctor when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> I, I worry sometimes that we do a good job of creating infrastructure, but are we getting people in the door to be served by that infrastructure? Could you comment on that quickly? Yes, and so I, you know, again, um, just to underscore, you know, the sisters have been here 171 years. They have never turned anyone down. Uh, they they know how to take care of patients. The you know this is a big transition from inpatient, but I will tell you, it's happening all across the country. This is COVID has really had a very very deep deep impact on the finances of hospitals across the country, and especially, to your point, poor small hospitals that aren't part of big systems. So our, our commitment right now is, as Dr. Garvin said, the services that we will continue to have will be outpatient primary care. And we have doctors that are staying on the campus, so they are not leaving. Uh, when we have a situation where a doctor is leaving, we do have an obligation to notify the patient and, let the, and help them find other kinds of coverage. We will continue to have behavioral health, Rosary Hall, uh, as an outpatient, and you heard all of the work that Dr. Biscaro is working on. And then again, you know, we have to, as we evolve, as the health campus evolves, we have to make sure that we are addressing the social determinants of health. But again, uh, if we don't have food, if we don't have, you know, people being able to get their basic kind of care, it's going to be hard to keep them healthy. So our, our goal is what the sisters have always done. 
they have met the needs, and as the needs change, they adapted to those changes. And you can look at their history when you come today uh, and walk through the hall. You'll see the history of the sisters over time, how they had to change. And we you know at one point they were taking care of infants because their parents were dying in the pandemic. And so, you know, they had orphanages. And then when that changed, they, they've adapted to that. So we will continue to adapt. I think the bigger issue is continuing the ongoing dialogue with Councilman Starr and our community so that we know that we're meeting those needs and that they have an understanding where they can get here. The other thing I would call, you know, That's really out for us. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman, when you, like, dealing with the pandemic, mm -hmm. you were the um, January the CEO, mm -hmm. is that correct? Of St. Vincent's, correct. St. Vincent's. Yes. And so you can see it coming because, as we mentioned, trends. Mm -hmm. And you did what when you, you saw it coming? You got an alarm to the Adams board or what? I mean, you know, with $3 million, you saw that not happening. Um, people not coming to the hospital, you see that also. Right. You're studying the trends when you're right. doing your analysis. Well, I think that, you know, for all hospitals, you know, we really had to stand back and, and take a look at, and especially for St. Vincent's, again, being a standalone hospital, you know, how are we going to manage that? As I said, the bigger issue for the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine is that they have other ministries that would be put at risk. And so we, we are very grateful for Scott and the Adams Board. Sure. Uh, they have supported us for decades, there's no doubt about that. But we have a whole other portfolio of business, which was the acute inpatient business that took care of patients that had medical issues and surgical issues, and that volume continued to deteriorate. So it really was, you know, a decision with the congregation, but also looking the leaders of all the health system to say, you know, what are we going to do and how do, how do we manage that? Yeah, would we have loved to have turned the hands, if COVID didn't happen, um, and again, this is looking in the rearview mirror, uh, we really felt that we would be a specialty hospital that would really focus on a surgical portfolio of uh, spine and ortho, which was really an institute and very, very, uh, you know, high-end spinal surgery and um, the bariatric surgery because those, those were the surgical portfolio. And then on the behavioral health side, continue with Rosary Hall, inpatient and outpatient, and then behavioral health services. But after, you know, the volume just, just never came back. And it wouldn't matter who else we tried to work with, um, you know, in terms of getting the volume back, the patients had already left. They're getting their care elsewhere. I mean, you, 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 uh, you see in leadership, mm -hmm. you CEO, mm -hmm. so you see um, there's, there's a change coming. Yes. It's not like it just happened. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you wouldn't be a CEO. You no. know, leaders mm -hmm. have to be able to see around right, corners. Right, right. You got to be able to see around corners. <laughs> so you see it coming. Mm -hmm. This is coming, and you did what when you saw it we, coming in that direction? We it, we created actually eight different models and scenarios of trying to get back on track financially. Uh, and so our, you know, we have great financial staff at St. Vincent's and, and literally working with the clinicians to see where that volume and would it actually come back. And to be honest with you, when you see month over month that the volume isn't coming back, we knew that we were at a point of needing to make a decision again to protect the other ministries that the sisters have. The sisters have been outstandingly generous because they've covered those losses for decades in the millions of dollars. And that just is not sustainable for us, I can honestly say. And you know, the market right now has changed dramatically in terms of investments, so that has an impact. Uh, we know that after COVID, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, work force issues uh, with not having enough workforce and also supply chain issues. So if you put all that on, it's a perfect storm. Um, we, again, uh, had COVID not hit, I think we would have had a different outcome. But right now, our, our vision for the future is in the health campus and looking at how, again, we can deliver outpatient ambulatory care because we know that that is a need that is, will, will continue on post-COVID. Sorry, no, 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 you're good. You're good. No, no, you're all right. I, I probably do have to leave in about 15 minutes, though, so I'll try to make it quick. Um, 
I, something, Mr. Chair, that I do think we need to focus on with our health department and, and other health partners in town is just understanding uh, what's what's kind of the connection rate between individuals, households, and a, 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 a primary care physician. How often are people doing those recurring appointments, and, and what do we need to do, if anything at all? Maybe maybe it's great. I, I, I have some <laughs> doubts that that would be the case. But how are we making sure that people are making use of these of these um, services uh, because uh, surely your goal is, is for people to be connected to yes, them. Exactly. Um, I want to I want to shift gears uh, for a moment and uh, focus uh, specifically on the the behavioral mental health uh, I guess emergency room or urgent care, or however it will be rebranded. And and thank you to the Adams Board. I, I was present last week uh, during your vote, and, and thank you for allowing me to do some public comment on that. Um, one of the things that I heard during that presentation uh, was approximately 25 percent of of people coming to the uh, to St. Finch's Emergency Room for behavioral health at this point are, are being admitted to inpatient services. And, and uh, uh, the doctor had a, a term of losing people in care transitions. We're now going to be creating a scenario where people may be coming in, and then we're going to need to uh, essentially export them out to whether it's Cleveland Clinic, UH, some other facility that's going to provide the mental health services. I'm interested in understanding what services are going to be provided at the urgent care. Are there going to be, you know, medical services dispensed, you know, medicine prescribed, and, and what is being done and how have you communicated with third parties that aren't at this table to ensure that they are able and willing to accept people that need inpatient services for behavioral health. So I'm going to start and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Garvin. So um, without having inpatient beds, we will have to have transfer arrangements, agreements with other hospitals. So we know that, you know, we will have to have an agreement with, uh, you know, the clinic, with UH, with Metro, because we won't have inpatient beds. And what will happen is that psychiatric ED will get backed up if we have to wait. So we have had those discussions and are working with it, but just know that we will we'll be, we're duty bound to have a transfer agreement. Now, the types of patients that we're gonna continue to see in the urgent care, and as I said, if you looked at the acuity at St. Vincent's in their um, medical emergency department, that acuity has continued to go down. So that really says to us, the sicker patients are pa bypassing us, largely by EMS. Um, now, when we talk about the psych ED, I'm going to let Dr. Garvin talk about exactly, you know, what we're looking at yeah. in terms of care. So, so those, so the folks who come there now are the the, mo the most acutely, critically, seriously uh, uh, mental uh, illness troubles. All of those folks are still going to be able to come. So we're going to be ready to accept all of those patients. Um, the there there, the meetings have been underway already with. <laughs> the citywide, the, the, the three health systems, uh, and our psych emergency department. The chairs of psychiatry have been meeting. The chairs of emergency medicine have been meeting. Um, they all know that uh, they, they all uh, wanted this uh, psych emergency department to continue, and they all realize that they will have to um, help it continue by. Uh, by making those smooth, easy transfers right by ambulance from our those 25 percent, some of them do it already. So there are days when our when our uh, beds are full, and already there are times when you need to be transferred to a different facility. So it happens some already. It will happen to anybody who needs to be admitted, and all of the health systems are ready to help. They all believe they have the capacity. And they all have said that they're going to take those uh, patients and they're going to take them right now. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I am very appreciative of the Adams Board providing the funding. I think that it's prudent and it uh, provides a, a I guess where I'm where I'm struggling is is this the beginning of a new long-term relationship, a new long-term provision of service, or is is this a stopgap for a transition period? And over the long term, it would it be more beneficial for a the the reestablishment or growth of other facilities that it would be a psychiatric emergency room within right. in, inpatient facilities. It, it, it's a very great question. I mean, really, it is. And uh, and again, thanking the Adams Board for all their support. I will tell you, just as a nurse, 
you know, if it wasn't for St. Vincent's and the Psyche D, it would have really created havoc in all the other emergency departments because these patients are very sick and they, they require specialized care and it's, it's just, it's very difficult. So over time, I'm sure, Scott, no, you know, we have to look at it all. I think, you know, there may be more need. And again, the way the crisis is in our country with behavioral health and with drugs and overdoses, I mean, really, we are losing people every day. I mean, now, now the, the advertisements are for, you know, everybody to have Narcan, the fastest acting, because you're going to need it someday. It's not if, it's when. So I, I really do think that, you know, the beauty about us is that if we all come together, and I think Dr. Bascaro said it, and so did Scott Chuck is saying as well, if we come together and we can all optimize the things that we can bring together, we can turn the tide, but we will never be able to do it alone. And I will tell you, that, and the sisters have always known that. We cannot, and they never could do it alone. And we don't want to do it alone. We really want a partner. And so I think that's that's the hope for the future. And, and one final quick question on the, uh, the, 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 the Psych ED. Um, psych urgent care uh, for let's say the 75% of people who wouldn't need to be referred to an inpatient bed at an external or a third party facility uh, are is, is is will the St. Vincent facility be prescribing them medicine? Yeah, just as they do now. Just so they do. so okay. they're 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 doing two things. They're making sure they're stable enough to to go home. Um, they are currently making referrals back to whatever community agency, whatever. Uh, um, connection they had prior to that emergency de department visit. And we're about to greatly expand the services for folks who, are, who don't need to stay in the emergency department with this, uh, um, uh, this crisis stabilization uh, recovery uh, uh, program. We're going to be doing even more than we already do to make sure that that person uh, is not just not getting a referral, but are, has a connection to whatever, wherever they're going to go for the next stage of uh, care for their illness. Thank so you. it's happening already. It's going to be better. And Dr. Biscott. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add, um, Vice Chair, I mean, it's a good, it's a great question. I think the, it, they're going to continue to get that critical time kind of intervention that they need, right? They're going to they're going to get that mm -hmm. right there. And now what we're proposing to do is add on to that, right? Provide that case management support. Um, ourselves and also partnering with others to really make sure people link and, and successfully link to treatment, right? That's, that's the added piece here that I think is really going to enhance what we, what we have been doing and now kind of going into the future. And, and just, just bluntly, what I don't want to see is the St. Vincent facility essentially become purgatory on the way to services in heaven. Uh, figurative heaven here. Um, uh, but purgatory might be an apt place for me as, as, as we continue. Um, I am so shifting gears again, I, I want to just touch base on the pediatric and maternal health uh, that, was, that was mentioned by uh, Dr. Cray, Ms. Cray. Um, and, and that's a critical need in our community, and it's, we've focused a lot on maternal health and, and the fact there was just an article, uh, I think, the last couple of days about how Cuyahoga County has uh, a much higher maternal uh, uh, mortality rate than, than nationwide, and that that's even uh, larger in Cleveland and even larger in certain neighborhoods of Cleveland. Uh, so, so, so the need is great. Uh, my, question, my first question is, uh, will the new services provide focused on maternal health. Will they provide directly or uh, refer women to abortion services? Will they be provided directly or be referral? Is yes. that what you're saying? So what we hope to do is attr attract partners onto the campus that can provide those services. So it will be like a micro, um, hyper, uh, hyper local opportunity for residents and families where services such as that will be uh, provided. Now, in terms of maternal health, that's what Dr. Garvin was speaking about in terms of beginning to move in that direction. I don't know if you want to speak to that from the healthcare delivery side, which is what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, I don't know how long ago it's been that St. Vincent Charity actually took care of pregnant women. Um, I was really, what I was referring to was um, care of these young families, primarily uh, moms and young children. Um, I, I, I don't know of a plan right now that we're going to get into um, 
uh, into uh, delivery care to prenatal care, but we do plan to take care of young families, particularly kids, and knowing that most of those kids are in a, in a household with a young mother. All right, so just, just, to, just to confirm, it is it, the, the, the maternal and pediatric care is intended at this point not to be prenatal care. Uh, I, I, I am unaware of any plan right now for us to provide that service with what's already available in, in town. Uh, to be honest, I think that we could become a location for some other, uh, whether it's one of the other health systems or some other group, yeah, uh, some groups in the neighborhood already who are very invested in, in uh, uh, better, uh, better health care, better maternal care for women in that neighborhood, run by women in the neighborhood. And I, I, I hope that we can um, partner with them in some ways. Over this short term, we, uh, we're, we're not planning on adding prenatal care. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilman mm -hmm. Vice yes. if I may just respond chair, to that the chair, also. The chair. You say Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Through the chair, too. <laughs> sorry. Um, I may just want to say that uh, we do have uh, two different ways that we are also addressing this issue that goes beyond the health care delivery. And one of the ways is an initiative that Ms. Bunton is addressing in the community, which is called Family Partners, where she has a team of individuals who are working closely with many families in the neighborhood in trying to support them to get to the right services and be a connector. One of the things we don't want to do is be a complete duplication of services and just keep adding costs, but to connect families and do the necessarily hand-holding and support to help them to do the work and the, get to the appropriate care that they need. And then secondly, I just want to say, I want to recognize the work that Joe Black, our promise, um, a, our program officer for health equity at the foundation is doing, in which he's supporting reverse ride-alongs, and he's actually taking OBGYNs from hospitals, and he's bringing them into the neighborhoods to actually talk to residents to find out how they can better serve these residents around maternal health issues and what some of the challenges are. So we're trying to work in ways of suggesting the resources are there, we've got to connect better in that regard. And, and so I just wanted to put Thank that you, and, and just, just to lay it all out, I, I am asking specifically about abortion services. Is the if the appropriate care that a woman needs yes. may be if a woman comes in yes. and is experiencing a miscarriage and needs a DNC procedure, will she be referred to that provision? I'm asking. This is a Catholic institution. Yeah, I'm asking. Is, I'm uh, asking if exactly I'm asking true. if That's abortion. I'm just healthcare. telling you, we do not perform abortions, yes, but we will that. always refer to an agency that can help take care of the patient. So, just by the Catholic, Catholic ethical and religious directives, we do not do that. And so, but we understand that we need to make sure that people have their right and get to the right place where that care can be delivered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I, I think that that is important. I, yes. That is an important issue to me. As, as a husband and father, I and um, I, I just, I just want to make sure that it's th this, this table knows how services are being provided around town. Um, with that, um, I, you know, my only final question was just what our path forward is and understanding how we can collaborate. But I appreciate that that's open ended and that's that will continue. So I'll turn it over to Councilman Harsh with any questions that you may have. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think most of my questions have been answered, but just for clarity through the chair, um, the answer to the job issue was that 100 jobs are remaining and 641 will be lost. That's where we're at. I mean, that's the number that we're using right around there, but we can give you a better number as, as we see, you know, people decide. So prior to this, 740 some jobs were on campus total. Okay. A um, couple of questions then. When you started off and said that $3 million was lost in one month, um, and that you don't turn people away who can't afford to pay. Mm -hmm. I presume through the chair that most of your payments come from insurance reimbursements? Uh, are we, most of ours come from government reimbursement and it only covers 70% of our costs. We have very little commercial insurance coverage. Government, or, I see. Yes. And um, through the chair, uh, are most low income people currently covered by some form of government insurance? They, we have Medicaid, 70% of our reimbursement is from Medicaid and Medicare, so 35% each. 
And uh, but again, commercial the commercial carriers that obviously pay better. And again, mm -hmm. it also aligns with the services. Okay. So we don't do cardiac, we don't do neuro, we don't do. But high through end. through the chair, when you say that you don't turn away through, people who can't afford to pay, there aren't correct. people who pay out of pocket anyway. Correct? They're all paid That's by insurance. That's right. They're self-pay. They're, we call them self-pay, which means no pay. So we have insurance. To, we subsidize. Them. Okay. Okay. So everybody's got insurance. There, mm -hmm. Go, Go ahead. ahead. So through, through the chair. The there are you. You would. Uh, there's a widespread belief that the, the Affordable Care Act gave all low-income people Medicaid. There is a huge gap. Uh, uh, you get. You can qualify for Medicaid. Uh, luckily, in this state, um, with if you make about 135 percent of poverty, if that's if that's your income. If you're 140 percent of poverty. Um, you do not qualify for Medicaid. There's a huge, huge group. And through the chair, what percentage of your uh, patients would have fallen into that gap of 140% of poverty? So, so I think what you're really asking is what's the self-paid portion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. That's, yeah. I don't, I don't I, know the, I'm I don't not know gonna the you, I, I'll get back to you with that number because I don't want to give it in I'm, I'm, but I'm, it's quite a bit. It, it might not be here nor there. Okay. Um, but moving on, I was just saying. Yes. Okay. Um, the job's lost, great. Right? Uh, who else through the chair does psychiatric emergency? I know that we're not, that you're not gonna be psychiatric emer emergency moving forward, but what are the other physical locations in Cuyahoga County that provide psychiatric emergency? So, yeah. so the, the psychiatric emergency department is only one, uh, one of two in the state of Ohio. And where is the other one? The other one is in Cincinnati. So there will be no more psychiatric emergency in Cuyahoga County? Well. By the current <laughs> name of psychiatric emergency. Though that's still to remain, you know, seen as to how St. Vincent's is working through this with the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, as well as Metro Health has a plan to open a psychiatric emergency department, okay. which we will fund some of that. That is our plan. And, and so I'm glad you, you, you jumped in because my question kind of goes back to you too. So the diversion center, does that, so a psychiatric emergency requires beds. Emergency requires overnight stay in beds. You have to have inpatient. No, inpatient. it's tw 23 hours. Yeah. 23, 23 hours, hours but that requires, okay. And, and does the diversion center provide that through the chair? Um, they can pick up some of the slack as well. Um, the, the difference between a psychiatric emergency department and the diversion center is that the psychiatric emergency department is a locked facility. The diversion center is not locked. It's voluntary. I see. And the 16 beds at the diversion center, was that correct through the chair? Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah, how many total? 16. I, no, 10. It's 10. Uh, it's 10 beds. At no, the 10 at the, no, I'm sorry, 10 at the, St. Vincent's, Saint Vincent's has 10, 10 beds in the psychiatric emergency Correct. department. Correct. The diversion center has 50 beds. What I was referring to is that they have 16 beds at the diversion center available for detox services. But there's a total of 50 beds at the diversion center. I see. What I'm really trying to get at and what's, what's kind of like sticking in my head here is that I, for the years before I got here, St. Vincent's was always thought as the detox center in, in, in Cleveland. And if you were, I understand that illness is a, is a broad term, but if you were ill because of drug abuse or, or, or overdose, that's different from being ill because of pneumonia. And if you were ill because of drug use, St. Vincent's is oftentimes where the ambulance would take you mm -hmm. to give you that emergency uh, treatment. And I'm just curious with, I, I get the brevities from the police every day, Mr. Chairman, um, overdoses are tripling murders in this town. And, and that's overdoses, even that with too. Narcan, everywhere. Even with people being revived time and time and time and time sure. again, we are still losing triple. Uh, overdose death is still tripling murder in this town. And it's not getting the attention that uh, the, the murder rate gets. And it's not, I, I think because the victims are drug addicts, probably, um, because we don't have as much sympathy for people that are engaged in lifestyles that lead to their own, their own demise. My concern, though, is without emergency, uh, psychiatric emergency, do we have the infrastructure to meet the needs of this community as we try to treat them and get them past their, their struggles? It, the, the campus transformation I, is one I, thing, I, and that sounds, that sounds yeah, nice, but I'm, I'm yeah, concerned about the yeah, bigger picture yeah, for us to be yes. able to handle this I, absolute I, epidemic. I, 
I, I think yeah. through, through, the, through the chair where I hear you going is, is that um, yes, we'll still be able to handle psychiatric emergencies on campus. Um, to your point of, of detox, so addiction crisis, um, you know, we still see those actually at the psych, you know, emergency department or psych emergency services and, and or whatever it will, will be called going forward. So that will continue, right? Too, to kind of assess and triage and monitor that. Um, Scott could probably speak to, there's a pretty robust continuum of detox services, um, you know, that exist in the community as well as a lot of, you know, um, independent, uh, you know, pri providers that are providing Medicaid assisted treatment, which of course we'll still also offer on, on, on campus, um, potentially to some degree, um, and or connecting people to those services. So I think it's an important thing to, to kind of note that we will continue to connect people to those services and the, the continuum is pretty robust. I know, Scott, yeah, you want to? Yeah, and you know, Stella Maris has detoxification yes. services as well as Salvation RV Harbor Light. Okay, right. okay. Um, and, and so while, while you're speaking, you said something that I didn't quite understand. You talked about parity between mental and behavioral health. I don't understand that. Could you elaborate a little? Well, so so the, the 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 medical system reimburses you know things at a certain rate, um, and there are certain rules as to kind of without getting all the technicalities right. There are certain um, kind of rules around around payment, you know. In the early two thousands, um, we passed a parity law to kind of make behavioral health well, right? To make behavioral health on par and behavioral health um, kind of reimbursement. So people, um, you know, you had to get, for example, back in the day, you had to get you know, cleared to do anything in mental health. You had to go through your insurance company to see a counselor, for crying out loud. You know, I mean, some of that has gotten better, but we're certainly, the behavioral health reimbursement system, to make it really simple, the behavioral health reimbursement system is not on par, is not equal to the physical health or medical care system. So men mental and behavioral are considered the same, right? Your mentality determines your behavior. So you're talking about, like, physical having pneumonia versus having a mental illness, that type of like physical right. physical health, phys phys physical health mental care behavior. versus mental health. It's mental, mental health. slash behavioral. Correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I see. So then my, I have two, two more questions, Mr. Chair. Um, Are you any counselor? I was trying not to be, keep us here the rest of the day. Um, to the Adams board, you, you, you started off, uh, Mr. Sicaro? Hmm? Mr. Sicaro, correct? Oh, Siki. Yeah. Scott Osiki. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, you're Sicaro. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Sicaro. Yeah. Yeah. Sicaro. I apologize. Yeah. Mr. Oh, Siki. Scott, right? <laughs> no. Are you the successor to Bill Denningham? Is that? Um, yes, there was another uh, person in between, but she passed away. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm new to this world. I'm just oh, trying okay. to, I, yeah. that was the one name I knew. Scott, but, uh, yeah. Scott's been active in the, uh, the Adams board really for, okay. for yeah, 20, decades, 28 decades. years. I've been with but the you, Adams board and four and a half as CEO. You, you, you said through the chair, sir, that um, you were been funding them before and you'll continue funding them. And there, there was something in there about um, new funding versus continued funding. And I'm curious how the proposal to keep the, the St. Vincent's operational involves how much new funding? So, so before we were at 3.777 million. Okay. That's what we were funding them for for this year. And this year we're funding them for 4,447,000,000. So what's, what's the difference there? Um, uh, 60, 74, 60. something yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So that, that, that bump increases what's going to be able to hold things together for the next year. Okay, and then after yeah, it's, it's that. It's a one year, it, it's a one year funding. So, right, so for 2023, we're going to be looking at, we monitor it now, right, the Psychiatric Emergency Department. So we're gonna be monitoring it again, of course, for this year, for upcoming year in 2023, to see what, what, what people will be using it, right? Over 3,000 people have used the psychiatric emergency room right. in the past year, and we're anticipating still that same number. But we're gonna be looking very closely at our entire uh, crisis continuum of care to see what effect, let's say if we change it from psychiatric emergency department to an urgy center, what exactly, okay. what effect will that have? And then, I'm sorry, and then well as we're gonna partially fund, we're planning to partially fund Metro Health's new psychiatric emergency department. So we'll have to also look at the impact of that okay. as well. And, and and so then back to you then through the chair. So, so, so the Sisters of Charity had been losing money for a decade on keeping this facility open. Yes. Correct. Some bridge funding will help you keep your operations going, but 
but it they wasn't don't keep the psyche D. ED. Yeah, Psych they're, they're two separate things, two separate. right? The psychiatric emergency department funding was yes. really, I mean, was yeah. never in jeopardy, and, no. and you always Understood. had the money yes. to yes. operate that. So the deficit you're talking about is the hospital. Yes, right? on the inpatient side. So the constant losses from the inpatient care. So, you know, that's really where the losses stemmed from. Mm -hmm. And I just, and there's another technical point I just want to make. The, the, Medical emergency department will become an urgent care center by CMS regs. If you don't have inpatient hospital beds, then you cannot call yourself an emergency department. So just so you know, that, I, yeah, that's, that that's the urgent care. And so in right. those services, Dr. Garvin talked about. And then the Psych ED, again, will continue because of the great support okay. from the Adams Board. And also, you know, we have the, the staff to so take care my, of So my question was really going to be, though, uh -huh. it, would this retooling make you whole? Will, 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 will the Sisters of Charity... We are still not out of the woods. And I mean sincerely, in terms of financial issues and challenges that we will face, uh, we still have... And, and, and so there's still going to be long-term operational we have concerns to to about look at how this we facility, operate. regardless of okay. And and my, my question then, very specifically, and I I, I, I want to get to you, um, how many, how big is the footprint of Sisters of Charity? How many other locations do you have in the county that you're also? So in the county, yeah. um, the the campus itself is 550,000 square feet. But we have Joseph's home, we have Mary's home, we have Lyda Hearts uh, in Bedford, we have Regina Health Center in Richfield. Sure. We, you know, so they the sisters have, and they at one point they had hospitals in South Carolina in Canton. The oh, most yeah. recent, okay. so Mercy in Canton actually went to the Cleveland Clinic. I was born there. Where are you? Well, there you go. Canton Mercy. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, but anyhow, they have a con installation of services um, that were both healthcare, you know, hospitals, and now, you know. So this is a national years. organization, and this it's is a, one facility well, of a national yes. footprint. It's got, you know, obviously in South Carolina. Two states. Two states. It's now in two yep. states. Mm -hmm. I see. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Talking international. Through the chair. He so been through the chair, I, I, uh, I, I hope I didn't confuse things about uh, labeling of the psychiatric emergency department. The only reason I said what I did is I didn't want you to hear us say psych emergency department, psych emergency department over and over again, and then, and then uh, find out in a week or two or three that it is called something else. What I will tell you is that the services are not going to change. The, we, we're going to do emergency services. When I talk about urgent care, we're not talking about a psychiatric urgent care. The, the urgent care is for injuries and medical stuff. The psychiatric ED may have a different name, may not, but will probably have a different name, but it will do the same stuff that it's been doing. Again, thanks to the Adams Board, what we have done, we're going to continue to do. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to think there's going to be a step down in the level of service in the psychiatric emergency department. I, I, I understood the, the, the technicality of the title. Um, Okay. Um, last question uh, to everybody, and this is, and, I'll, and I'll, I'm all done. Um, is 16 beds for detox even close to enough? No. For so that was the 16 beds that Rosary Hall has. Right. Then there's beds at St. Vincent. I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> at Stella Maris, and then also at that? Harvard Light. Um, Maggie, if I may ask, Maggie, Mr. Chair, Maggie, how many beds do we have at Stella Maris uh, detox beds, and how many at uh, Salvation Army. Salvation Army has, I think. You got to come to the uh, table with you because the listeners won't be able to hear you from back there. And state your name and then you narrate. Um, there you are. My name is Maggie Tolbert. I'm an Assistant Chief Clinical Officer at the Cowboy Adams Board. Um, the question is how many beds are at the Salvation Army Harvey Light? They have um, 20 beds, I think, uh, around 20 beds. And at Stella Maris, I think they have around that same number. And I think Scott has already stated that we have the diversion center that also do detox. Now, those two agencies also do a, another, a variety of services for SUD. SUD is substance use disorder that we call. So 56 total in, in the city or the county? Mm -hmm. no. That's 
that doesn't include the fact that this also happens in multiple hops, hospitals. Uh, There's not a dedicated unit, uh, but this, uh, this kind of service is also uh, happening. Yes. Yet, uh, essentially, most, if not every hospital, is doing some of this. Okay. So a lot of those patients are actually treated on medical surgical Ooh. units. Right. Okay. Going through detox, that the specialty at St. Vincent's is that it was a specialized unit. But if you went to other hospitals, those patients are getting admitted, mm -hmm. and they're ending up on a medical surgical floor, being cared for, going through the detox, or end up in ICU. Oh, okay. And, and Mr. Chair, the beds, you know, Salvation Army and Harbor Light, and at St. Vincent's that were there in the diversion center, that's in the Adams Board's network of services. Okay. I see. Yeah, in other words, there's, there's more out there, right? So there are hospitals and then, um, you know, for-profit uh, companies and institutions yeah, that, that have, have beds. Yeah, yes. Correct, exactly. Yeah. Is a good example. Okay. Like okay. okay, thank you, Chair. Yeah, you know, I want to I say this also, to put on my uh, business hat, too. When you, you narrated about poverty around the community, you know, you know doing it, your community outreach workers, that's going to be a great thing to... Um, to build relationships with key stakeholders and partners in the community. Um, having, uh, I know some people are going to lose some employment there, but when you, you have a hospital and the hospital is strong in the community, if they were to reach out, you mentioned, uh, I think it was jobs, workforce. And, and so it would be great for residents to walk to and from uh, their house, their homes, to their employment. And, the, and employment would be St. Vincent's Charity, Cleveland Clinic, um, University Hospitals. Mm -hmm. Then you build that neighborhood up um, in the community and you, you did some community outreach, different programs to deal with health care inequality. You know, you have a lot of health care inequality around um, um, hospitals, and that's not good. That's not good. And so um, what scares me about and no one mentioned closure of the uh, of this hospital, but when they close, um, you have patients that stop by stores and grocery stores, and they stop by um, other business institutions that surround the hospital, and they purchase. Um, so it's not just the hospital. The hospital it breathes life into that neighborhood because you're stopping mm -hmm. there in the purchasing power that the hospital also brings that fight against poverty, those are, um, it helps out with the circular economy, as we would say. And um, when you mentioned the, the poverty uh, piece, hmm. so it's healthcare, but it's also the financial that it brings into that, um, into that community. So when I look at uh, when Mount Sinai closed in the Glenville and Huff community, um, a lot of businesses around it closed. And when that happened, um, people that were working at those businesses also, the purchasing power, that it brings, uh, it, it, it diminished, mm -hmm. you're right, and, and we fell apart. So you could do a lot with a hospital around there, and Metro Hospital is moving in, our clinic is moving to the Glenville community, so automatically I was thinking, and I'm talking with other um, businesses, we can build around there and, and bring in more, and then more housing, people want to come with more houses to hold nine yards. If that hospital is not just looking at land and they want to reach out and have community health care workers to reach out into the community, that's, that's very, very important. They have to build trust. And the other thing that you have to look at is, um, is goodwill in a neighborhood. That goodwill is, is hard to measure, but the goodwill is the mm -hmm. trust in the community and it helps build out the fabric and it builds the culture in there. So when I was listening to what you were saying, um, the, I, I look at it as a shame when you have a hospital in a neighborhood and you have abject poverty right around it. That's not good. Mm -hmm. That's not good at all. It's a shame. Mm -hmm. um, we need to help in the city. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen hospitals go start from here and then they spiral downward. You got to let your council member know also as well as me when you do your your progress reviews. Mm -hmm. That's why I was asking you yes. about um, strategic direction and tactics yep. to keep us. Whole. You gotta let yep. us know mm -hmm. so that when, like, doctor, when you were narrating us working together for the good of the whole, that we can narrate, and then we could um, go down state to advocate for dollars, whatever the case may be. You don't just want to have a hearing 
and uh, then we walk away and we're not talking with each other. Your, your best advocate um, for you is Council Member Starr and as well as me as the Chairman of Health. Mm -hmm. And then I'll talk with the other Council Members as well as the Mayor. The Mayor cares as well. Sure. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Bibb, oh, he's an extremely a bright guy. Yes. Very confident guy. Mm -hmm. Mayor Bibb is very, very bright. I talk with, of course I talk with him off and on often. And, but you gotta let us know. You gotta let us know when, as soon as you see it or you see risk, you mm -hmm. have to let us know, here's a risk. I need help mm -hmm. with this. And then, because we don't want you to, um, um, to keep spiraling down. Mm -hmm. When you lay people off, um, that also hurts us, it hurts families. It breaks families up because people are not working. Um, we want to make sure that the hospital is strong. And just to, to underscore for the Sisters of Charity oh, St. Augustine, they, they clearly, um, you know, this was a very, very hard decision for them. They did not want it. Yeah. The only other thing I can say to you is that they are committed to staying here, and that's why the vision for the health campus for the future is really important. Um, but we honestly hear exactly what you're saying. St. Vincent's is an anchor on the health campus. It will be because of its history. It will be because of the services that it's going to continue to provide. But mm -hmm. you're exactly, we, un, we truly understand that coming together and making sure that we keep our communication, you know, with you and with the, the city and the county and all these other constituents is really critical, and we will continue to do that. Yeah, because you guys, you guys are part of the, um, the culture of Cleveland, especially you mentioned 1865. Yes. And I know that um, when the migrations happened, especially for the African-American community, Central was the first African-American community in the, uh, in the city of Cleveland. When, uh, when my people migrated from um, places uh, like Birmingham, Alabama, yes. Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and, they, and they migrated up here to, uh, to Cleveland, yes. Central was our first area. Yes. And then we migrated out from Central to Glenville, Huff, and places like that, but it was central, yeah. and, and one of the only hospitals that we could go to was your hospital, mm -hmm. so that when um, we hear about what's, what is going through, we got to be there, because you, you're the fabric, you and you've been there, and that central with the African-American community, that was our first stop was central, the central community, and the same thing, um, and when you look at the Italian culture, um, um, big, big Italy was also in the central community. Yes. It was a farmer's market that was over there. That's it was bigger than the little Italy that's over there in the University Circle area. The Italians, when they migrated from Italy, they migrated to the central area, and they also went to St. Vincent's. So yeah. you have always been um, in our fabric thank in the city of Cleveland. Yes. So we have to work to try to keep the hospital strong. So we thank you uh, and, and Adams Board yes. for helping. So I always kept my eye on it. And matter of fact, the wife and I would talk about you guys, even when we're at the house, how are we going to try to help to, um, to, make, it, um, to make it work? Because we know the background history of it. Right. Well, we, we are honored to have been here today. And again, we thank you for your support. And, and the sisters thank you because, again, their whole, heart, their whole lives have been lived out to take care of the poor and vulnerable. And really, they, they do it. And they've given everything. They, they've given, they'll give their last dime to, to do it. So we just want to make sure that they have an amazing legacy. And it, and it is here. So thank I'm gonna you. I'm going to give you uh, my cell number. OK. Um, I'm interested, but you narrated earlier. Uh, I forgot your name, but Sue. Susanna, Susanna yeah. text Sue. me, and we want to help out with the, uh, the arts because you're already creating the structure there. Love to talk and, about um, it. And we have some dollars, thanks to this council member as well. He's an artist also. All yes, right. yes, Chris plays um, the guitar. He's an artist also, you know, and um, <laughs> we want to help out to make that work. So give me here, and I'll give it to you. Oh. So I'll write it down right so that way you can mm -hmm. reach out to me. And I'll get your card. Yeah. It's been going it's off. My cell been going off, so i got to clear it. <laughs> While I'm sitting here, I can't talk. And and I eat yours because I'll be on your campus at 2 p.m. Yes, sir. All right. Today. And then I'll stop by. I'll swing by as we say okay. so talking music. All right. We say swing Wait. by. All right. Can you leave your uh, copy with Ann? Um, Telly, Ann is over there. She is great. I have to say, um, 
she's extremely bright, man, and work very, very hard and execute well. And uh, I think this is your last staffing, and she's leaving, uh, going to uh, another position. So. Well, she told me I kind of. I didn't know what was going on because she kind of like didn't want to tell me. You know, when we older, I said, you know, I knew something was going on. When you older, you kind of feel, you know what I'm saying? We kind of can feel things with this. <laughs> if somebody want to tell us something, you kind of know. You kind of know from our life experiences. And yes. she said it. She told me. I was like, uh, awesome. But thank you very, very much. Um, and thank you very much for staffing. And she'll give me your notes. And yes. So thank, thank you. you. And God bless. No, God thank bless you. you. Um, any other questions? And great meeting you. I'll be at the campus at two o'clock. All right, I'll be there. Have to I'll do some there. things. Talk right. to my assistant. Okay. And can you leave in? The... I'll leave her my card, and we'll connect so I can get her a copy. All right, sure. cool beans, yeah. cool beans. And I'm there at the campus at two o'clock. All right, great. I'm there. Great. So with that, um, the committee is adjourned. Take care. Thank you.